This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Dry season day, and this is Safari Live. Good afternoon and welcome to our sunset safari on this chilly, overcast, windy day. That is a wildebeest and it is snorting at us for some unknown reason because, well, there's no predator between us and it. My name is Tristan and on camera today I have got Senzo and we are coming to you live from the Kruger National Park, well, Sabi Sands Game Reserve actually to be exact and that means that we're interactive. So, hashtag safari live on Twitter or on the YouTube chat if you want to ask any questions. Now, I don't know why our wildebeest is alive alarm calling at us. I think he's for some reason a little bit perturbed by the wind today. Maybe there's a scent of something that's blowing around. Also he could be just a little nervous of us given that these conditions mean he can't hear very well and he's seen a car and maybe he's had a bad experience before where the car has been around and a predator was close by or he might have even seen a predator at some point today. You can hear it's very difficult over the wind to actually hear him snorting but he's got this nasal snort that he lets out from time to time. Oh, he's going to keep quiet because I said so. But it is really tough over the winter here. And that's why this afternoon is going to be a tough game viewing experience. Because when predators move around, often we rely on alarm calls to, for us to locate on that predator. And I can hardly hear that wildebeest from this distance. So we're going to have to be right on top of any prey animal if it spots a predator for us to even hear what's going on. And hopefully the wind will settle and that will help us a little bit later. Now, the Mara team should be joining us maybe at some stage. They, I believe, are being pelted and battered by some serious amount of rain. So Brent is busy tucked away in, a, in his little makeshift tent. And I think Taylor's still hunkering down at base camp. So we'll get to them probably a little bit later. So for now, it's just with me. And hopefully, it's going to be a busier day than what we had this morning. Although we did have a f wonderful morning. We had the Inkahuma Pride with the Birmingham males and I'm sure they're going to be around. So our plan for the afternoon is probably to go and check around to see if little Tumba maybe is back from his traumatic experience this morning. And those of you who don't know what happened to Tumba, he killed him a first big male impala and it was stolen by the hyenas and they chased him. So maybe he's come back to Twin Dams for a little bit of a drink. So we're going to go check around there and then later we're going to head towards the lions because I'm pretty sure they're going to be quite active tonight and there is apparently a rather large herd of buffalo on its way southwards from Buthel's Hook. It's apparently close to 300 buffalo which can you believe it? That is an amazing number because we haven't seen I think more than 10 buffalo this whole year so it's going to be incredible if we get that herd coming down and I'm pretty sure if that herd starts to head in this direction those lions will pick up the scent and pick up the noise and they are going to be up and moving pretty quickly we know how the Nkuma pride loves a good buffalo meal and so let's hope that by the end of the drive those buffalo are starting to come into Juma and the lions have picked up their scent and we might be in for an incredible finish to our afternoon and our week because we've had the most amazing week Right, but let's carry on. Our wildebeest is very upset with us and we want him to relax. We don't want to irritate him any more than we already have. Not that we've done anything wrong. We've just been sitting here and our wildebeest just thinks that we are the worst thing in the world by shouting at us. Senzo, have you been chasing the wildebeest around that it's scared of you? No. Okay, excellent. Good. Maybe it's just jealous of all the wildebeest in Kenya at this stage. Now I've got to quickly just go down and do our little time lapse so Senzo is going to hop off the vehicle fairly shortly as I move along towards the edge of quarantine. This is Sebastian's project but Senzo is very kindly helping Seb out and doing it while he's away and on a day like today is the perfect kind of day that Seb wants because he wants changes in weather and clouds and all of that so it makes for a perfect day to do a bit of a time lapse so we're going to just leave our little time lapse there and get a couple shots and then we'll carry on probably towards treehouse from treehouse to twin dams from twin dams well 
then I'm not quite sure where we'll check before we head onto the lines, like I say, a little bit later in the afternoon. I was hoping though that this wind was going to stop. The wind has been absolutely howling all day and I was thinking that maybe by this afternoon it would blow itself out because these weather conditions are not the worst if it's not windy. The problem is when it is windy it doesn't really help us very much at all. The animals don't really like it and things like elephant and, and buffalo even and even the cats will go into somewhat of hiding. They go into drainage lines and thickets so we're not going to get that amazing experience that we had yesterday where the Ellies were running to water unfortunately that will be curtailed by the windy cold weather we're having today now I believe a lot of you are very excited about the prospect of a buffalo herd coming onto Juma I know isn't it exciting not that we have even enough water to sustain a herd of 300 buffalo we're going to get into a situation where our dams would be drank absolutely dry if they arrived because they are animals that do drink a lot and they will muddy it up and cause quite a lot of disturbance which is not ideal particularly if they go to Gari Dam because Gari Dam at the moment needs as little pressure as possible although what we saw yesterday was quite interesting with the elephants because we saw a herd that kind of left and another herd arrived and that herd actually didn't really drink from Gari Dam so the water wasn't lost to to drinking they more just splashed and played and the water itself actually really stayed in the dam so it was quite a interesting thing to watch I would have thought that that herd was going to go drink but they didn't they actually went right past Nest Cam and, and further on so maybe they went to drink around Gallego Pan I'm not 100% sure or northwards to towards Tamboti Dam on the northern side of the Bifelzook boundary we find that they often go drink up that way it's kind of a route that they walk up the Mulawati drainage and then all the way into Bifelzook towards those big 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 dams that they have up there there's a couple of really large dams that are called Manzi and there's Senzo say Senzo, wave. He said, when Senzo's got one glove, are you Michael Jackson today, Senzo? Oh no, he's got his cloth to clean the lenses. So Senzo is looking very spiffy. But while Senzo finishes up his time lapse, let's go across to the Brent Leo Smith, who's hiding away from the rain in his little tent. Welcome to the Maasai Mara, everyone. <laughs> I know we are stuck in the pouring rain, and I've got some very important tools that every time we spring a new leak, Leatherman, gaffer tape, cable tie. And uh, I'm starting to get a new leak at the moment, you'll notice I've added cable ties all around, and uh, we've just started to get a new one. And uh, excuse me, but I try shore us up here. Oh, that one's not long enough. We need the double cable tie. So it's been raining solidly for about 45 minutes. Oh, we, are we getting leaks again? Lights, oh, Fergus is telling me I must put lights on. Here we go, we have lights now. Um, and uh, it's raining so hard that I was actually worried the canvas roof was going to burst while our mattresses were. It started sagging. We weren't concentrating while we were trying to fix other leaks. And uh, but all of a sudden looked up and... It was like a pregnant elephant belly above us, uh, full of water. And so, lots of different tricks to stay dry out here. Yeah? There we go. We've got a few little gaps that we try to control. We've got to have some fresh air in here, otherwise it'll get quite bad as well. And, but that's basically, we're not moving. And unfortunately, I think for the rest of the drive, uh, even if we wanted to drive anywhere, we can't. So we were actually on our way to try to find that beautiful cheetah. And we even left early uh, to get out to find the cheetah. Taylor was smart. Um, she was leaving at normal time. So she's still safe and dry in camp. And we it's raining so hard we can't even actually move the vehicle at the moment and I think just getting up the hill to Angama is going to be a challenge in itself uh, but we will keep you updated uh, as, as we sit here I think we're probably not going to move for the next while lots of thunder and lightning around uh, but while we wait out our storm let's go back to Tristan uh, who's expecting rain but is still dry at Juma. So I believe we're live. Unfortunately, 
my comms again are letting me down our little earpiece and so our earpiece thing is a bit of an issue because there's apparently a shipment that is supposed to be coming to South Africa that's been waylaid and I would imagine it's maybe something to do with the hurricanes that have been all over the US side I think they come from that side I'm not 100% sure but anyway there's a shortage in South Africa nobody's got them and so we're waiting patiently for new earpieces so I'm still with problem earpiece and problem earpiece sometimes means that I don't hear anybody and well at least we can hear Lou now so that's good news I've not gone very far I've just managed to putter around quarantine there we go Lou I can hear you now thank you so I just have to fiddle a little bit and then sometimes it comes back it's very intermittent luckily I've got sensor at the back here who lets me know what's happening a little bit so I do apologize if we go live and I'm just sitting there staring blankly into space which is what sometimes happens although this time I was actually looking for animals as we were going around the corner but we're just meandering our way down Philemon's dip we're going to slowly head towards treehouse like I say to do the other time lapse that Sebastian is busy with. There's a little diker over there. Right, let's just get back. Where is our diker? It's gone, I think. Our diker has run away. Which is, well, fairly typical of a diker. They don't really sit around too much. Philip, uh, no, no other camera traps. This is just something new that we started with Sebastian. He's just trying to do a little sort of story on the changes of the season here at Juman, how drastically it changes from summer to winter and how we go from dry desolate bush like we're seeing now that's very thin and it is yellow and browns and no leaves to full dams and green and grass and lushness and so that's the kind of thing so what he's going to try and do is do a year's worth of pictures every single day at the same sort of time and then what he's going to do is pull those all together and it'll be a short little clip as the days go on and hopefully it'll be really cool just to see how everything goes from brown to green back to brown again it's going to be really cool so I'm quite looking forward to it and I'm hoping that it will be nice and it will go really well and the plan is is if they're successful and they work the way that they want to is that we'll start to do a couple more around and we'll try and look around what we also want to do at some point is try and see if we can do a bit of camera traps work on if we find let's say like the other day when we had that white-tailed mongoose carcass and tracks for the honey badgers just set up a little camera there and leave it and see what we get on it the next day so we We'll do stuff like that but at the moment currently no other camera traps on the property other than what we've got currently and I suppose these aren't really camera traps either there goes a little stenbok over the road there it goes ah Tony Two Toes who well according to your name has feet on the brain and you want to know how Senzo's socks are looking today and I actually just asked Senzo that very question where are the fancy socks today he said to me no today is no fancy socks because the weather is not conducive for fancy socks today is the dull brown socks because it's a gray dull day so we're not going to put those socks on camera because well dull brown socks don't work for anyone so he promises me the next time it's sunshine we're going to see some more brightly colored socks from Senzo and I think this could be the new thumb is Senzo's socks so instead of thumb we're going to have socks from now on and hopefully we'll get some really interesting ones I feel like Senzo's got some hidden gems in his bag somewhere he said he's going to dig around in his bag for some special ones so I'm sure we're going to see some very interesting ones. I reckon we get Senzo some socks all the time and we'll just give him all random colors and all random shapes and sizes and see how many different socks we can get him to put on camera of course it will be quite an interesting thing like I say instead of seeing a thumb at the beginning of drive we will see well socks at the beginning of drive there you go Senzo that's how you're gonna have to start your drives from now on no longer fingers you're going to do your socks and toes We'll have to get sends all kinds of fancy ones. I'm sure there are lots of interesting types of socks out there. When I go and leave next, Senzo, I'm going to go look for some socks for you. So Lou says now we know what to get for birthday and Christmas. Indeed, Lou. Now hopefully this little bird is going to stay still. Stay still, little bird. No, you're not supposed to fly away. Because there is a beautiful bird that is right here. Have you got it, Senzo? Back or forward? Back. Ah, okay. So Senzo says he's got it. Say when? There, you go. there we go. 
Okay, well done Senzo, very good. So there is our little bee eater and they are beautiful birds and on a dull day like today it's nice to get a bit of color, a splash of color in the bush and these little guys provide a lot of color. You can see bright yellow throat, that orangey breast and a greenish back with a little blue eye stripe that goes over the top of it and so these little bee eaters as they are called will jump around and fly around with a lot of agility and hunt varying insects that we get in this area so we'll get things like little flies or bees as the name suggests that they'll go after and then once they grab it they often go to a branch like that and if it's something like a bee and it's got a stinger they'll wipe it on that rough bark pull the stinger out and then swallow it like that so they're really cool birds to watch and really difficult birds for our cameramen because they are super fast and agile as they fly and turn and twist from these small little perches now the cool thing about these guys is these guys are here all year round so we see the little bee eaters in the winter months a lot of our bee eaters are migratory and we know that migratory birds are coming back so i would expect any day now to hear the european bee eaters starting to come back and they're a beautiful bird so they should be here soon and then after that the carmine bee eaters will be the next ones and the carmines are probably my favorite bee eater they've got this rosy sort of maroon color to them and they really are vibrant and beautiful so hopefully we will see them towards sort of December as the next one. Now I know yesterday we were talking about, or this morning I think it was, about the next migratory birds to arrive and I was saying cuckoos will be the next ones and all of those and I forgot completely about some of the other migratory birds that we should be seeing. So we should see the woodlands kingfishers which are normally around the end of October beginning of November. I know because it's close to my birthday in November that we normally see them for the first time so I always use my birthday as my guess as to when we're going to see them. It of course is not always the case but we do sometimes get it right. I think one year I did find them on my birthday. Same as the impala lambs. They also get born around that time. And then after them, we've actually got red back shrikes that should arrive. I forgot completely about them and the lesser gray shrikes as well as some of the others. So that's still what we can look forward to coming our way, but I'm really hoping that the cuckoos start coming soon because they are vibrant and they add a lot of color to the bush, particularly the classes and the Diedrich and if we really were quite lucky and we got onto the Mulawati and I don't think it's been recorded in this section but you might one day have one is the African emerald cuckoo and the African emerald cuckoo is a beautiful bird I've seen one down at Lion Sands on the Sabi River you hear them a lot but you don't see them very much and so I will show you exactly what that bird looks like because it is an incredibly pretty little cuckoo species to have and I'm not sure we've ever had it on Safari Live I, I'll have to ask Brent because if he'll remember if we have now where are the cuckoos let me quickly find them for you cuckoos of course when you uh, Lou if you can ask him about the African emerald cuckoo if he's ever seen one here at Juma I don't think any of the guys have seen one but this is what I'm talking about if we look down here at the bottom is the African emerald cuckoo and look at the how beautiful that male bird is it's got this iridescent emerald green back with this bright yellow chest and those white wings it is a magnificent bird and it is I promise you it sparkles emerald so it is a wonderful bird to see and we don't see it very often and it's got this very conspicuous call that you hear every now and then so it's a nice bird to to listen to and it's basically sings a song that says Georgie so that's how its song goes and then these are the other two cuckoos that I was talking about that we do see quite regularly and that I'm hoping both will come so the Diedrich on top which has got lots of coppers and and greens in it and then the classes cuckoo below so those two funny enough their names are actually linked which is quite cool so they, I will get into that one day when we actually see them and they are around. I'll tell you why they're called Diedrich and Classes and they are actually linked to one another as well as the song that they sing. Now for some reason I feel like some little fly flew up my nose which is not... Oh my 
goodness. This means that there is going to be a hailstorm, there's going to be snow, and Armageddon is coming because Brent Leo Smith has not ever even seen an African emerald cuckoo, only heard its call. And I don't believe it. There is a bird in the Sabi Sands that I have seen that Brent Leo Smith has not seen. In fact, actually, that makes two birds Brent Leo Smith because, well, the golden pippet of January 2017 is also one that's on the list that Brent has not seen here in the Sabi Sands. He has seen it elsewhere and in Kenya and Tanzania you do see them but not here in the Sabi Sands so that is a miracle for me to have seen a bird that Brent hasn't seen although he's got a couple that I haven't seen so I suppose we are probably even Stevens. He's had the corn crake as well as the purple banded sunbird so we are fairly close in terms of birds that we've seen in the Sabi Sands. But actually one to would love to know what other birds he's seen that I haven't seen here and it's likewise with me and him. If you know with Brent and I it's always a competition we've always got to see who's seen the most birds here in Sabi Sands and we're always having a go at each other about it. It's all friendly banter though so don't worry. But like I was saying just now that a fly flew up my nose and it's now causing a mass massive amount of issues because my nose is itching even though the fly is gone now it's still itching like crazy so I do apologize if you see me rubbing my nose it's only because everything's gone a little haywire in there I don't know really what else to do about it and it's a horrible feeling to have a it almost feels like the fly is still in there fluttering about Senzo's busy giggling at me because he thinks it's highly hilarious but I can tell you it's not a comfortable feeling having a fly up the nose hopefully that never happens again. Lou, you would think it's very funny. Luckily, it didn't go up my nose and then into my mouth. That would have been quite horrible. CJ, you're wondering why the female cuckoo is so dull in color and why? Well, it's pretty common in a lot of birds. A lot of birds are, the males are a lot more brightly colored than the females. And that's generally birds that have quite a a lot of competition for mating and so the males have to be brightly colored to attract the females attention and to show themselves off in order to get the females sort of look and gaze and to be able to then mate with them so it's normally when you've got birds that migratory birds are one that because birds all flock together here and they don't mate with the same individual every time they will then try and go after one another and try and sort of compete for mating rights and so the more brightly colored you are and, and the better you look well the more likely you're going to get a female so that's why the males are more brightly colored the females on the other side they're not going to really chase after the males they know that the males drive to mate far outweighs theirs and they will come to them so that's why the females are often a little bit more drab also females there's a theory that because they often are brooding chicks that their camouflage needs to be slightly better in order to not to attract attention to the nest and so that's why they do funny enough though you would think with these brightly colored birds like the classes cuckoo Deidre cuckoo um, even the African emerald that they would be easy birds to spot out here with emerald green feathers but remember when those birds arrive here it does not look like it does now it will be lush it will be green and those birds blend in very very well it's only when they fly do you actually see them outside of that they are very well camouflaged and it's difficult actually to pick them up now this is the tracks for our mating pair of leopards from yesterday that went south unfortunately towards little gari aaron you're wondering if there's any bird in particular that i'm looking forward to seeing well, I think the Woodlands Kingfisher is always a bird that all the guides look forward to seeing. We completely sort of get irritable about their call by the end of summer, but before summer arrives, that's one of the birds that we all look forward to. It's bright, it's beautiful, it's got this call that just reminds you that summer is on its way and a change of this dry winter season. So for me, it's it, that's one of the birds I always look forward to seeing. Um, like I said, the carmine bee eaters, they're a beautiful bird, cuckoo species, um, booted eagles, Wahlberg's eagles. So there's a number of them. In fact, all the migratory birds because they generally add a bit of sort of dynamic to us. They add a bit of extra variety lots of colors and so it's a it's a great sort of splash of color into the bush and, and a way of just sprucing everything up and getting everything going now there's a beautiful bird that has just come out talking about a bit of vibrance just on this tree here is a woodpecker now it looks like a golden tailed woodpecker there it is you see it's just out and about it's one of the smaller woodpeckers that we get here 
Oh no, it's gone behind the big tree. Hopefully it will come out. Let's just be patient. Maybe we'll get lucky and we'll see it coming out. I can hear it pecking away behind the tree. Is there another one here? Because it sounds like another one pecking as well, but it doesn't look like it's going to come out. Since I'm going to try to go forward a little bit and see if we change the angle, maybe we will be lucky. Oh, there it is. It's just hopped out there. It's going up the branch. So there it hops. It looks like a little golden tailed woodpecker. And off it goes again. That's nice to see. The golden tails have a beautiful gold tail, and that's where they get their name from. The little red cap that they have. And they're one of our smaller woodpeckers that we get here. So we have the very large bearded woodpecker, which is the biggest of the grouping. And then we get the Bennett's golden tailed. And right at the back is the little cardinals, which are really quite small. Cardinal woodpecker. And they're a beautiful bird as well. Oh no, now, while I drive around and contemplate the cold of the Sabi sands, the wind that is howling and the grey overcast clouds, I can still count myself very lucky that I am not sitting in a very wet, soggy tent like Brent Leo Smith. We're still here, we're still in the rain. And uh, the first storm that hit us seems to have passed and we're in a bit of a lull. But unfortunately, it looks like there's another storm coming from on top of the mountain. So we're not moving anywhere soon. And uh, I noticed Tristan was uh, talking about an emerald cuckoo and a golden pipit. And you know, in themselves, those are really wonderful birds for the Sabi Sands. But Tristan, they can't compare with the purple banded sunbird. Or... Ah, yes, the corn crake. Who can forget the corn crake? Now, speaking of birds, as I pop my head out every now and then, I'm gonna see, I can see some really big flying ants coming out, so the birds are gonna be very happy about that. And I'm hoping that if we do have a little bit of a lull and it stops raining, we might get some birds really taking advantage of these flying ants um, if it stops raining. Uh, unfortunately, if it continues to rain, uh, we are pretty stuck. Oh, Fergus is too... There we go. Hey, Fergus is trying to get me wet. <laughs> getting the... <laughs> I get the evil laugh from behind. Oh, there we go. Getting the, the water off the roof. Uh, but I can see a little bit of light down towards the east but unfortunately there is still a wall of water heading towards us. Now, um, when it rains like this, we, we have to stay on uh, the main sort of big access roads. Uh, if we ventured off-road or onto any of the small little tracks that we normally use, uh, we would probably be stuck and uh, not very popular because generally what happens in these type of soils, you get stuck, someone comes to rescue you, they get stuck. Someone comes to rescue them and you, they get stuck. And then someone's got to call a tractor or a bulldozer. And they're generally not very happy when you've got to call a tractor or a bulldozer to pull you out. So we will be, if we do manage to get moving, and I'm hoping we will, uh, we will be sticking to the sort of very big main access roads. And uh, other than that, that's an update from us. I think we've managed to keep most of the leaks to a minimum. And it's, it's a little bit of a drip there, but that's not too bad. Holding out well, uh, and I know it's my fault. I didn't even bring any hot water for tea today. Silly, silly Brent. I should have brought some water for tea. Oh, I can hear some birds. There's one very unhappy looking starling flying away. Oh my goodness. I don't know if you can get it, Fergus. The road is actually flooded over. Uh, uh, you can't. Um, let me try, just to try. Well, hopefully, because the wind's coming from the other side. Just see if I can get a, a gap in the, for Ferg here. Now, can you see the road there? Oof, there we go. That's the other storm I was worried about that's coming from the other direction. So there's that. And let, me, let me just try and move the car a little bit. So the main road to Olololo Gate, now, I've never seen water flow over that um, little lugger before, but at the moment it is flowing right over the road. Can you get it there, Ferg? 
So I don't want to leave it too open. Is my arm in the way? Oh, wait. There, wait. Okay, let me have a look. Oh, it's only wet, Fergus. And you see the road. Uh, to the right a bit, I think. I right, switch off, sorry. Let me move that. Let me try. Um, which cops have... I said a little bit to the right, I think. And... Oh, wait. Oh, sorry. I'm trying to see which trees you're on. Where, where are we looking? Okay, I'm trying to see. You see where I'm looking at the flight, eh? Oh, goodness. Sorry about this. Let me try this way. You see the water? There's the, <laughs> There's the flight across the road. Oh, dearie me. So, <laughs> we're, we're going to be sitting here. I better just hook my thing back in. And uh, there we go. Let's hook that back in to keep us dry. Um, so we're going to sit here. Hopefully we will be able to move. As I said, we're going to be very limited in the areas we can move. And we're just really hoping that really big storm from behind us doesn't hit us as well as the initial storm. But while we do that, um, spring is in full flow here in the Mara. But it sounds like some of the little early signs are starting to show at Juma. They are indeed, and this is the first one that I've seen on this particular gardenia that's at Treehouse Dam. I've been looking and hoping that this gardenia will flower, and that's the first little bud of a flower that's starting. So soon we're going to have a bush that will be covered in these beautiful creamy white flowers, and as they start to age, so they'll start to turn a more yellow color. But that's the beginning stages of it. You can just see the tip of it where it's going to start splitting out and forming the petals a little bit later. So they have a beautiful flower and becomes very aromatic this plant it's wonderful to actually see so I'm super glad to see that Philip you're asking which flowers am I looking forward to returning to this area oh lots there's so many flowers that cause a bit of color oh there's actually an older yellow flower that's already opened and is now drying up and shriveling so that's the yellow color it will turn after being creamy white and you can see that one's all a little bit dry has been blasted by this heat that we've had over the last few days but philip um i think probably my favorite flowers that we see in the summertime uh roadside pimpernel is one of them um i like the Blue comelinas, yellow comelinas, yellow justitias. Um, what else do we I see? The, oh, the African violets. They're always very pretty as well. So those are come some of the more common ones that we'll see quite a lot of. I really like those. But my favorite sort of flowering tree of the spring summer generally is the sausage trees. I always loved when I was at Lion Sands and watched the sausage trees flowering there and just the number of different species that we used to get feeding off those flowers because they form a really big tubular flower and lots of nectar which means you get a lot of different types of animals and, and birds and insects that congregate around there. Lots of nectar in them and you used to find bushbuck and nyala and kudu impala. Um, you'd find baboons. All kinds kinds of things feeding off the flowers as they fell and then in the trees was you know monkeys there was brown-headed parrots you would find um, all kinds of green pigeons there were all kinds of things that would go there and feed off that nectar and then after that at night you would also find the bats would go and feed off them so you would sit there at night and you would get these bats coming into these beautiful big maroon flowers and if you sat for long enough and you used the light the right way you could get some of the most incredible sort of views of bats feeding off flowers and funny enough the sausage tree's biggest um, now what's the word I've forgotten what the word is biggest pollinator is actually bats so you find bats are one of the biggest pollinators obviously insects and and birds do play a part but bats are one of the big ones for sausage trees so it was really amazing to watch that and like I say it's a beautiful tree you get these long sort of stems that come down and then eventually the sausage fruit grows off that so wonderful to see and a really nice addition to to a colorful environment or actually a, I suppose a drab environment because they flower early early in the summer or springtime
Unfortunately, here on Juma, we don't have a sausage tree that flowers. We do have one sausage tree that I've seen, but it doesn't seem to flower, maybe a little bit on the young side. Hopefully one day we will start to see it flowering and we will see those big sausages forming. We get them at Chitwe. If we go to Chitwe, we'll find on the deck of Chitwe Lodge, there's a big sausage tree there that's produced a lot of flowers and a lot of the sausage fruits. So next time I'm at Chitwe Dam, we'll try and zoom across the dam wall and see what's going on. Now that reminds me that I've been saying all week I'll go to Chitwe and check on the gymnogene nest. And I did actually have a look the other day when we had the mating leopards at Chitwe. I went past the gymnogene nest quite late, but there was no sign of the gymnogene at that stage. It unfortunately, I think, wasn't there. And I suppose I came around with a whole bunch of lights, so maybe it flew off before I got there and before I saw it. Strawhead, you want to know how animals know how to avoid poisonous plants, flowers and mushrooms? Well, I suppose now it's all pretty much instinct as well as learnt behaviour from the adults. So after a while the adults won't feed off something and then the young ones only get taught to eat what they see their moms eat effectively. So that's one part of it. But most of the poisonous or toxic, should we say, plants generally have some sort of coloration to them that the animals will avoid so they know bright colors tend to mean things that they mustn't eat and most of those animals that are plant eaters or eat any sort of mushrooms or anything like that or all have good color vision so they'll be able to see those aposomatic colorations which are generally reds and blacks reds and whites on mushrooms for example those kind of things they will know straight away that's not something that they can eat so it's a combination of colors just red on its own is fine there you'll find they'll feed off that but like I say combinations of reds and blacks reds and whites greens and blacks blues and blacks those kind of things all mean toxic Although some animals have developed systems that can handle certain toxins. Oh, mating dikers. <laughs> There's mating dikers. Love is in the air. They're now running away, but there was a dike on top of another diker right there. They've just trotted behind the bush. They're just behind the quarries. You can see them moving. There, look, you see, they're mating. Look. <laughs> Like I said, love is in the air. We had mating leopards yesterday, mating dikers, far less aggressive, the dikers, than what the leopards are. And this is the only reason we're probably seeing them. Look, he's going to try and jump on her again. So male at the back, there we go. Oh, no, she's not having any of it at this stage. She's decided she's shy. She doesn't want us to be seen on camera. This is not the way she wants to grow up and, and spend her life as a woman. She does want, not want to be shamed by the world. So she's going into the thicket for some privacy. Exactly, as Lou says, imagine if her mom saw this. Well, Lou, I think her mom would be a little on the embarrassed side, but she is going for privacy at least. He doesn't mind too much. He's uh, just trying his best. And this is what will happen with antelope species when they try and mate, is often the male will try and jump onto the back of the female. She'll keep moving forward and when she's not ready. And eventually she gets tired of it and she succumbs and, he, and eventually the mating takes place. But see, look how he's sniffing towards her genital area so he'll be picking up the scent of her urine and they she will he will be there you go he's actually even tasting the urine so that he can work out how she's doing and if she's in heat and whether or not she's receptive to mating but he's certainly trying his luck now i know it's not the best for you but you can see every now and then him jumping on her back trying to be able to copulate with her keep trying buddy she'll eventually wear down and it will happen for you Bet he wishes she was more like the leopards in that the leopards force, the females force it on the males. I think that's what he would prefer because he's getting really nowhere at the moment. Also, he's a very young male. You can see those horns are tiny. He's almost smaller than her as well. That's maybe why, maybe that's why she's also moving away is because she's thinking, well, sorry, buddy, you really aren't what I want. I want the beefcake stud of the bush not a young upstart to be mating but they're coming out into the open so there we go yeah he's trying no there we go again <laughs> Paula you want to know about Steenbok gestation well first Paula these are not Steenbok these are diker so it's a little bit different to the Steenbok but in terms of Oh, uh, wait, so don't worry, you did say Dyker and not Steenbok, so I will just want to double check it, but I have an idea it's somewhere around five months, but I want to just make a dub double sure. 
quickly. It's been a while since I've spoken about mating dikers, so let's just check quickly. Uh, seven months, sorry, is their gestation period. So they've got a slightly longer gestation period, seven months, quite close to actually the impalas, which is quite strange given how small they are in relation. But that was cool. That's not something you're going to see every day. And we know that our dikers are normally very, very shy. Not today, that's for sure. I wonder where they went off to. Did they run off, Senzo? I didn't see. I was busy looking in my book. Oh, there they go. They're still busy chasing after one another. Now, that's what a leopard wants to come across. A leopard wants to come across Diker like that because they're so preoccupied with mating and him messing around, pushing the female and causing noise that they won't be able to see a leopard coming. And then it's perfect conditions for a leopard to be hunting and be able to then try and get to them. And it's not uncommon. I've, like I said, I've seen Tundi taking out pairs of Diker often in the mating season. And you come to a tree and both of them are in the tree and she's sitting panting there so if she's around we know she does hang around in this particular section then they're in for trouble now this is the area where Tumba made his kill in fact the drag mark for it is just up ahead here and he dragged it towards that big tree so his intention was really really good he, did, he was trying to go towards that big boar bean that we see over there since so it'll be better when I go around the corner so don't stress about it just yet but he was, his intention was to try get it towards a big tree and I'm sure he was just not strong enough to get it up and into the tree itself and then the hyenas arrived and that was the end of that. So he did try his best but basically it was somewhere here, I think the vehicles have probably driven over it by now but he was dragging it towards the tree and trying to get it up towards that big burr bean. If he had been able to get it there he might have been able to eat a little bit and then take it up into the tree itself and that would have been a perfect place for a leopard to have a carcass so poor boy unfortunately didn't get that far but at least he made a kill Philip you're asking will Hosanna and Tumba be renamed when they get chased out of this territory well Philip unfortunately they might depending on where they go so and the thing is is that they shouldn't theoretically um, but sometimes they go on to certain reserves where they feel the need that they must rename animals because they don't like the names that they've got already when they come to that area and so we might see a situation where some of them get renamed and and you might find a different name for them. I'm hoping it won't be the case. I'm, I'm really hoping that they both stick with their original names and we have a situation where we get to still follow them as they go along. Like I say, wherever they, they end up, I would love to maybe go there one day and see them as big adult males. It would be wonderful to watch their progress and, and to actually see them as big units. But they might, their names might get changed. But the thing is now is also with the way that we follow animals and the way that it's kind of this social media we can still use their name for our purposes so they will always be Hosanna and Tumba to us at Safari Live no matter where they go that's what they are going to be called so hopefully wherever it is they end up that the guys do decide to keep their names because it would be a travesty if they change them I like both of them and I like both of the names that they've got at the moment I they seem to both kind of roll off the tongue and suit them so it'll be really a bit of a travesty if they change ah look at that Senzo you see the snake skin there's a snake skin over there which I would imagine is a snake that shed its skin over this warm period the snakes will get a lot more active when there's heat so there's the skin and, and it probably didn't shed where that particular branch is it, it probably has been blown by the wind today and then just caught up in that buffalo thorn difficult to say what kind of snake it is I mean we could go do a scale count on it which would then indicate exactly which snake species it is but quite big oval shaped scales so it could be a boom slang or a vine snake I can't see the head area too well that's all shriveled up so it would be easy if we got the head section and look if it's got a big big round eye then generally it would be boom slung which is Afrikaans for a tree snake so we call it a boom slung and it is toxic but we'll find a lot of this at the moment as the snakes are getting going for the summer they will have grown a little bit through the winter so they then have starved a little bit and they can then separate from this older skin and then they start to to pop out of it they get the new skin that's flexible and soft and then they'll go on a massing, massive feeding mission and that's when it starts to get warm so they know that the warmth can help them be active and they can then go and try and find the food that they need so it's really cool to see 
And this is the second snake skin I've found in less than a week, so it means that the snakes are starting to move, and I hope that we'll start to see a few more of them on the drives. They are an interesting part of our ecosystem and something that we really need here, because otherwise the rodent population would get out of hand. And funny enough, if rodent populations get out of hand, so it can cause a catastrophic effect in this area. The rodent's urine, sometimes, well, certain rodents, carries a disease that can really affect elephants, funny enough. So you would think that elephants would be able to combat any rodent, but their urine on grasses and things, the elephants come and feed off it, and they seem to be very prone to this type of disease. It attacks their central nervous system, and they die from it. So you've got to be a bit careful with rodents, and that's why snakes are vitally important that they hear, as well as owls. And we know we haven't had a shortage of owls, Although the owls seem to have disappeared over the last little bit. Maybe it's because they're all nesting now and when we were seeing them it was because they were vocalizing and they were trying to find um, partners and trying to build up nests and that's maybe why we saw so many for that sort of two, three week period when Byron and Taylor were here. It really was quite crazy. We were all seeing owls all over the place which was really cool. Right. Tundams, come on Tamba, be lying here somewhere. Maybe after the struggle of his kill he wants to come and have a bit of water and he's decided to come and lie at the dam. It's a long shot because he did go south but you never know. So I didn't catch the name Lou, if you can just repeat the name for me please. Uh, Francis from Israel, you want to know if it's mating season or do the animals mate all year round? Depends on the animal, Francis. Some animals will mate any time of the year. Others will mate at certain spots, times. So we know with impalas, they tend to be April, May, maybe a little bit in a second rut into June, but generally around April, May, um, which is when a lot of the other species will also mate. So kudu are a little bit earlier than that. They generally in March that they're mating, but you'll find things like buffalo, um, elephants, the cats, they all mate at any time of the year. They don't really matter when they mate, they just will mate and, and, and produce. And it's normally linked to the way that their sort of life works. So if they are a um, an animal that is a predator, there's always going to be prey items. And they'll always be able to find food within that system. And so it's okay for them to be able to um, have cubs at any time. If they're a herbivore, generally they try and coincide with the summer months so that they can produce little ones that can feed off the nutri nutrient rich grasses that are around in summer. So you'll find that is the case with the herbivores. Things like elephants, which is a mega herbivore and can find food any time of the year, that's why they'll produce at any stage. Also, a very long gestation period. So to time that right would be nigh impossible to get it right. So that's why you find different in them. Hmm. No sign of our little leopards anywhere here. <laughs> so David, <laughs> you want mating honey badgers next because we've had mating leopard and mating diker. If we see mating honey badgers, I don't know. I. I, mean, I think I would probably do a flick flack off the vehicle if we saw mating honey badgers because that's not something you're going to see every day and I've yet to see mating honey badgers to be perfectly honest. I've seen honey badgers with babies, I've seen male and female honey badgers but never them actually in the act of mating. So if we see that today, well like I say, then I'll do a flick flack off the front of this vehicle and hopefully not kill myself. But whether or not we'll see that is anyone's guess of course. So we'll try and see maybe a little bit later if if we can find some honey badgers, it would be nice. But no leopards around here that I can see at this stage. There's just a vehicle that hasn't noticed me at all. Look, there they go, driving past. Haven't seen me in the slightest. Just goes to show how people can miss even a big hulking great vehicle with a white antenna. So you can imagine how easy it is for people to drive past things like leopards. Hmm, I wonder now where I should go. Maybe Mulawati. Mulawati has been good to us. just want to check up here quickly because I know Tumba often spends a lot of time in this general vicinity. I 
Elizabeth, you want to know what's going on with Janet Jackson? Don't worry, we will go past her again. This morning, Janet Jackson was in very vocal spirits and I don't know if there was a second Janet in there or if they were attacking the lilac breasted roller nest I am not sure if there's young ones in there I really am unsure of what was going on with Janet Jackson but we will go pop in again just to have a look I'm just going to quickly say hello to Surprise who's from Chitwa so we'll just quickly say hello to him hello Sapi how are you? very well thank you good 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 where are you off to? Okay, cool. There's a Makulu Shlami and Buffalo Zoo coming south. They say, they say like two, three hundred. Yeah? Yeah, it's coming slowly, hopefully. Are those in Gala still Lalo Panze? Yeah, they're still there. Skoro? No, I'm not there. You're Mampin Pans? Yeah. Is it Nyama? I'm still Mampin Pan and Nyama. Okay. You do to Pamba? Is it Maningi Movers? No, Lutu. Just um, show Sheldon and Peter. Okay, I'll find that side. Yeah. Now the Inkumas are close to the Triple M as well. I'll let you know if they cross. Okay, they are on uh, your side? Yeah, just that north of uh, the Transformer side. And that Mapazi still there, that one, that Shire? Yeah, fine. Walking fine. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Sharp, but also to my daughters. Yeah? No, sorry. <laughs> so people are asking if they can be on camera, which obviously we know doesn't work quite like that. So they want to say hello and send shout outs to people, but just had to explain nicely that that doesn't work. So what we're going to do is, because I was going to look for Tamba, well, I'm not going to do that anymore because Surprise told me that the sticks are busy eating something right here. So let's go and have a look at the Six Pride. It's been a while since we've seen them. So we'll go pop into them. We'll have a lion-filled afternoon. We'll do a little bit of the sticks, and then we'll go to our Inkahumas and Birmingham's right towards the end of drive. But we might as well go and see the Sticks Pride while they're around. And like I say, if they're eating, then that's a perfect opportunity to go and see them. But I do need to radio and tell the guys I am coming. Otherwise they're going to be a bit confused as if I just arrive. Peter, 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 come in. I wonder if they're going to even hear me. Well, given my earpiece, probably not. We'll have to get a little closer. I can actually see the tracks for the sticks going all along the driveway here, so I'm sure they will be eventually on Chitwa Chitwa. Peter, Peter, Peter. Nope, it doesn't sound like anybody can hear me, so I'm going to try to get up over the ridge and then down towards the dam. Hopefully by then they will copy me and hopefully nobody is on their way there that we push them out of the sighting, which would be quite nice. Oh, uh, now Brent Leo Smith is forever a kid at heart. He pretends like he's an adult, but he's not really. He's, like I say, a child still at heart. And it sounds like he apparently has found himself some flotation devices for his arms so that he doesn't get wet and he doesn't get carried away by the torrents that are flowing around in the Mara at the moment. Well, we haven't moved a muscle. We're still in the exact same spot and uh, it is still raining. It's, it's definitely let up a bit, but we sort of seem to be on the edge of two storms. Now, apparently Tristan's being very romantic or saying all the animals at Juma are being very romantic. I think it's probably because Ali is back at camp and he's feeling all soft, warm and fuzzy. Aren't you, big boy? But anyway, we've got a question from Justin. Um, he wants to know, how many different uses are there for duct tape um, in, in the bush? Well, the cameraman will... I could probably say, just off the top of my hand, they make screen or uh, shades for their, their, their eyepieces with duct tape. Um, we use it to pretty much for everything. Um, another good thing that you can use it to keep cameramen quiet. If they talk too much, you can just when you use a big piece and you put it around their head so it pulls their hair and then, then they generally behave. Um, what else can you use duct tape for? Uh, you can't really fix a puncture with it. Although, um, I mean, we use it for everything, really. Keeping cables on the roofs, um, fixing your shoes. <laughs> it's a very good one. I've actually seen someone make a pair of flip-flops out of duct tape. Um, that's a very expensive pair of flip-flops, because <laughs> it's, it's like gold out here. I mean, the two things that we sort of really, really can't really live without... Um, 
just in case of needing to fix something in a bind as are these two things. Now, the one day actually Vim and I, our roof broke and we held it together till we could get to a welder with cable ties and duct tape. So it does have many uses. Uh, it is a, probably, yeah, probably one, these are the two most useful things uh, coupled with a Leatherman and then you're sorted. You can pretty much fix anything out here. Now, I mean, trying to keep a lookout, it definitely has slowed. And so I can only see out the one side at the moment, so we don't know if there's other weather coming. And still, unfortunately, uh, it's still a, we're unable to drive. Ah, uh, Leah, who's eight years old, is wondering why we can't drive on the lane in the rain. Uh, Leah, unfortunately, there's there's. A couple of reasons. Um, if we drive, we tend to get water in here, and we've got lots of uh, very expensive electronic equipment, um, and the cameras and thingamabobs that make signal go jiggy my jag all the way to your, to you. Um, and the and the other reason is that we're not going to see many animals uh, because when we drive in the rain, even if I do drive in the rain, it's nearly soft enough for me to start driving. The only thing you're going to do is see me fighting my steering wheel as we slip and slide across the road um, because uh, we're not going to be able to look out at any of the animals because it's uh, raining too much. Otis oh, Simon would like to know, where do animals go in the rain? Do they go into dens or they out in the open? Well, things like zebra and stuff are just standing out there somewhere. There's some, someone behind us there. There's some elephants in the distance as well. But no, they, they just stay. And some animals will try to go down to a den. And actually, really heavy rain in some cases brings animals out of dens. And their holes will flood. That's why it's a very good time to see blind snakes is just after rain because they've been pushed out of their holes by the water and they're on top of the ground where you don't normally find them. Uh, sometimes warthog holes get flooded and they'll have to leave their dens. Um, same goes for mongoose and, and, and art fark. Uh, but it is quite uncommon. So you'll find a lot of art fark dens, for example, go very, very deep and then come up. So there's a little raised area that the water can't get into. Okay, well, we're going to maybe try and move a little bit and um, see if we can possibly get close to those elephants and we might be able to open up the one side and keep the rain coming from the one side. So while we do that, let's go back to Tristan, who's on the hunt for lions. And I've already found the lions because the lions are directly in front of me. Seems as though they're on a kill of some sort. I don't quite know what it is just yet, so I'm going we see the sticks pride it's not often that we get to see them so I'm looking forward to catching up with them for them for a little bit and spending some time there's some little cubs that are feeding hello guys <laughs> it's good to see the sticks pride it's been a while since I've seen them a few vultures are around as well but how cool is that it looks like they've got a water buck that's what they've managed to bring down on Chitwa's massive open area right in front of the lodge so those guests must have had a wonderful day of watching lions feeding all day long and look at the fat little bellies of those cubs they are full 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 so nice to see them and their mange is not looking too bad as well they're looking a little bit better than the last time I actually saw them which is good news there's one or two that are a little bit mangy but not as bad as I thought they would be they seem to be coming right a little bit and hopefully they'll be able to just last long enough for the rain once the rain comes along then we're going to have a situation where these guys will be absolutely fine remember that the mite in mange is proliferates during the dry period as soon as we start to go into a wet period then they start to calm right down and the the mites start to disappear and the little ones then will stop itching they'll stop scratching and their fur will grow back nicely just like the Inguma cubs has and they'll be okay look at the one on top of the tree they're just poking its head over the top there's a fallen over tree and there's just one little head that's oh no it's come down again unfortunately oh there it is you see this little head just poking over what are you doing oh no now you're down again I was having a little game on top there. So none of the tiny, tiny cubs are here. They've only just been born, so they won't be introduced to meat yet. For those of you that don't know, the third female gave birth, I think it was about, what is it now? Four or five weeks ago. Very similar age, maybe a little bit older than the Inkohuma cubs that we've got. So it's 
somewhere around there. So the third female, I don't see her at the moment. I think, oh no, sh no, I don't see her at the moment. I think she maybe is with those small little cubs after feeding. They often will go to the little cubs to go and get food. But the other cubs out here have bellies the size of beach balls. Uh, they can hardly move at the moment. They're kind of waddling around, which is great to see. So very cool to see the pride at least feeding well. And, and this will all help with combating those mites. Aiden, who's six years old. Hello, Aiden. I hope you're having a nice day. You want to know whether the lions will swim in the dam here. No, Aiden, they're not going to swim. The lions are a bit scared of water. They don't like water on their coats. Also, today is very cold, so they don't want to go into the water because then they're going to be wet and cold and miserable. And there's crocodiles, and crocodiles are very dangerous for especially little lion cubs. I've actually seen a lion cub being killed by a crocodile, and so you have to be very careful with crocodiles. And so the lions will avoid the water. They'll go and drink there, but they they're not going to go and swim in the water at all. Even if it was hot and it was really warm and the lions were having a tough time dealing with all the heat, they still won't go swim in the water because of the crocodiles. They're going to be very scared of the crocodiles and rightly so. Crocodiles are animals that you have to be very nervous of. Now we've actually got some water buck that are still right here close to us that are watching the lions feed. I wonder if it maybe wasn't a youngish one from one of these adults and that's all. Maybe it was the mother for one of them and that's why they're sitting just watching the pride feed on them which is not very nice but it is the way it goes. It's how life works out here and you'll find that sometimes if it's a mother or a, or a young one for that mother they will spend hours just watching the lions feed off them as they kind of work out what's going on and try and come to terms with the loss. There comes a hooded vulture that's going to land directly on the branch. That's very nice, isn't that? Wonderful to have a hooded vulture sort of at eye level close to us. It's a very cool sight. Now the hooded vultures are the ones that will feed right at the end. They are going to be the ones that will get food only at the end of this carcass. They're going to basically be the last last birds to get nutrition out of this in fact you'll find the white backs first and then the hyenas and then only will the hooded vulture get food later and there's the white backed vultures are on top and there's a number of them still arriving it's the clouds are seeming to part a bit of sunshine is coming out and that means we're going to get a situation where it will be perfect conditions for vultures to fly it will be a bit windy but it's going to be nice thermals that will start coming out and they'll find this fairly quickly and then come and try and finish that carcass once the lions move off. Lynn, you're asking why is it that the Styx Pride always gets mange? It's not that they always get mange, they just haven't recovered from the mange from last year. Remember, it's not exactly been a very wet year, and so the mange itself is still um, present in the adult females, and so they've had their young ones, and then unfortunately what's happened is that they've continued to carry that mange and as it's gotten dry again so it's proliferated and, and expanded and has gotten onto them. Also remember that the females even though they're able to deal with the mites, the cubs when they're younger their immune systems are not as good they also lie together a lot whereas the females will kind of separate themselves a little bit more groom themselves a bit better whereas the cubs are rubbing up and, and constantly in contact and so that mite crosses between them a lot that coupled with the fact that you've got a situation oh look at those faces how cute is that and that's coupled with the fact that these cubs like i say have a weaker immune system than the adults means that they get the mite a little bit worse remember the cubs from last year died and these are new cubs so that mite was introduced to them when they were still young and that's why they've been battling with it if we get a few years of wetter weather and these cubs survive and they build up an immunity to it then the next dry season they should be a lot better off than what they are currently you can see the older cubs in the background they actually look a lot better than the the newer cubs so the one that's waddling off there they look a lot healthier sea control do you asking if lions always carry the mange mite yes they do in fact most animals carry the mange mite even people have mange on them it's tiny tiny little mites that live in my hair it's completely natural it occurs but like i say when it goes through a period of very dry conditions that's when that mange populates and you'll have a situation where 
mosquito get really out of control and, and particularly in younger animals. The adults tend to be able to deal with it a lot better, but the younger ones tend to get a little bit out of control. Now I do apologize if you guys are picking up a lot of wind. It's just here on Chitwa Open it is completely clear of any vegetation and that means it really blows through here and we get a situation where it's going to gust and so I do apologize if the wind sound is quite loud. There's unfortunately very little that I can do with the wind. It would be nice if it did stop. At least it's blowing these clouds away and we look at least have a nice clear sky above us. So hopefully tomorrow will bring about a little bit warmer weather and far less wind than we've experienced today. But how beautiful is the light on the Styx Pride? I mean it's early afternoon but it's beautiful. Ooh. Okay, you're wondering if the notches and the ears are caused by the mange. Not necessarily, it might be they, they've scratched and they've caused um, scabbing and, and, and they've caused a bit of injury to their ears that is now healing and you're getting those little notches that have formed. It also can be ticks, so ticks also feed off the ears of cats and they cause these little Vs, as well as fighting around carcasses. You saw just now that the two little cubs were giving each other a bit of a hard time and belting one another and that will cause a little bit of scarring and scrapes on the ears every now and then but most of that's to do with the mange it's itches and they scratch the ear and they cut it and and they cause a little bit of a disturbance around the ears and around the face and in fact when you see mange it often is really bad around the, the muzzle area the ear area and then underneath the belly if you look at Tinyo he's still got a little bit of that mange on his tummy as well so it's normally in the warmer places the more difficult to reach places where they battle to groom that it proliferates and causes a little bit of damage so but these lions are going to be very very content by the end of this afternoon they are probably loving the fact that they have a nice meal that will help also with the colder weather if they've got a meal the body will be using energy to try and stay warm and so this meal will just help keep that going they've also got water close by it's nice and open so now with a bit of sun in the afternoon I'm sure the little cubs are loving it you can see the fact that they're lying most of them out in the open it shows you that they're not worried about the heat of the sun at all in fact they're probably enjoying that little bit of heat but that carcass is all but done Jared's buddy, you say you've never seen the Styx Pride before. How old are these cubs? Well, the Styx Pride, so we don't see them that often. They spend a lot of time to the south of us. But in terms of the ages of the cubs, you've got two older cubs, which are the ones on the far left at the back there behind the female. So those two that are lying down at the back. Um, and they must be now about nine ten months I think somewhere around there and um, they're maybe a little bit older I'm just, just trying to remember exactly when the first time I saw them was it's been a while since I've seen the stick pride too but somewhere around there is how when they were born and then these newer cubs are about six months old so they're a little bit smaller and are not as large as what we see with the others now look at this vulture is going to come in uh, no it landed short I thought it was going to come and land just on the termite mound above the lions I think it wanted to and then it realized hang on a second that's not a good idea to land right on top of the lions and just pulled out and then stopped right where it was but it's really cool to watch the vultures in this wind because the wind holds them up this one's coming down now as well Senzo it might be quite nice unfortunately it's gone behind the tree but let's see the wind is just holding it so it's for filming is really cool because they come over fairly slowly and then they just turn oh no it's caught the wind and is now gone off but as they come in it's quite nice because they just sort of float and glide in which is very cool Jones, buddy, the vultures, no, they won't start getting close to this carcass yet because there's cubs around eating. If you see behind that cub's backside, there's one vulture, it's a little bit further away, you'll find that the hooded vultures generally are a bit more brazen and will come a little bit closer. There's a, a few vultures talking behind us. In fact, actually, it's tawny eagles building a nest by the looks of things behind us that are making some noise. But if you look behind that cub, look, the cub's trying to drag the carcass. That's so cool. 
what are you doing? But there's a female there. There's a big adult female. So if any vulture came anywhere near, that female is going to chase those vultures away. So the vultures have got no chance whatsoever. Even with the cubs, they won't risk it. These lionesses would chase those vultures long before they got anywhere near. And the cubs themselves, um, I suppose if they were by themselves and no adult females, which would be pretty much impossible with lions then maybe they would bully the cubs off but you know there's always going to be some adults around that will protect them from these vultures so they've got nothing to worry about so the vultures will only get this once the lionesses take the cubs away and they move off completely which will be shortly you'll find a situation where they're going to come off at some point oh, you can see there's a dis do they have a kill up there so it seems like the tawny eagles behind us are making a bit of noise. You can see one right at the top. And Senzo says he thinks that one of them's got something in its talons. So I wonder if they haven't got some sort of food up there. Maybe they got a piece of this carcass or they got something that they're feeding on. I don't know. Difficult to say. A lot of talking going on between those two. Unfortunately, there's the lighters in the way, our presenter lights. So Senzo's battling. Hold on, Senzo. Let me just turn you slightly. I'm going to just try and see, because I want to see what, exactly what these guys are eating, whether they got a piece of the carcass or whether it's just some other food item that they've got. So where do you see it there, Senzo? Is it in the, with the, the bird itself or above it? The bird itself? No, that one's got nothing in its talons that I can see. Has it got something in its talons? Jeff, you're asking what type of carnivorous birds visit or are in the Sabi Sands. Jeff, there are lots of carnivorous birds. Remember that the insect eaters are also considered part of that. But in terms of out-and-out -out meat eaters, vultures, tawny eagles, battalia eagles, um, and of the vulture species, there's five that we see here regularly. Um, so, well, four regularly, one not so much. Uh, what are the birds of prey are eating strictly meat. A number of the sparrow hawks, um, pretty much all the eagles, we've got falcons, we've got um, normal hawks, um, goshawks, so lots of different straight out and out meat eaters that we get in this particular area. We're very fortunate that we see a lot of different birds of prey and it's a wonderful place for birding the Sabi Sands. It's amazing watching these birds actually coming in. Here comes another tawny eagle straight over us and look how it's going to land right here. There we go. Look how it just hovered in. Amazing. You see how much control these birds have got and how they use those wings and they just sort of slowly descend down and then drop onto the branch. It's an incredible way that they do things. So that's the tawny eagle, which are generally around carcasses. It's very common to see them in this area. They do like to scavenge as well. So, go. you asking, do I think that the, well, do I hope that the Egyptian vulture will fly down to the Sabi Sands? Every single moment of the day, I know it was seen a couple days ago, but far north of us, and I keep wishing that I see it drifting into this carcass, and I see it here, but alas, no luck so far. Hopefully, though, I'll get spoiled in one day, see it. For those of you that don't know what we're talking about, the Egyptian vulture is a very, very rare vulture species. In fact, it shouldn't really occur here, but there is one young individual, a juvenile, that for some reason has found itself in the Kruger National Park. And we are getting regular sightings in the Kruger Park area north of us, and I'm really hoping that at some point it comes down to the Sabi Sands. And imagine if we see it on one of these carcasses, because I think it would be a first record for the Sabi Sands. And as far as I know, no Egyptian vultures have ever been seen in the Sabi Sands before, so it would be a wonderful thing to see the Egyptian vultures in this area. So I'm hoping one day. And for those of you who are wondering what the Egyptian vulture looks like, this is the bird that we're talking about over here. So the adult is a beautiful white coloration. It's not the prettiest head that it's got. It's got a bright yellow face and a beady red eye, but it's got this white coloration. And those are easy to spot. But the bird we're talking about is this one over here. So it's a sub-adult. It's got this, or well, juvenile should I say, it's got this dark pigmentation, a gray-blue facial patch and slender beak. But the big identifying feature is this very diamond-shaped tail. No other vulture has a diamond-shaped tail as 
prominent as what you see there. The only bird we could confuse it with and why it went unnoticed for so long is the juvenile hooded vulture. So if we have a look at the bottom here, this is the juvenile hooded vulture and you can see, look how similar those two birds look. And it's very, very, very difficult to tell them apart. In flight is the best way and you see they've got a much more rounded tail than that diamond tail that we saw or wedge tail that we saw on the your Egyptian vulture. But maybe one day I'll be lucky enough to find it. I certainly hope so. It would really make my day if I did see one of those because that would be another one we could add to the list of Brent not seeing in the Sabi sands that we've seen. Right, back into position for our lions because where we are now, the trees in the way. Let's go around quickly the side. Truth be told, you're asking lifespan of a vulture and how long do they live for? Well, here in the wild, generally we find our vultures living between sort of 15 and 20 years for the most part. Unfortunately, a lot of our vultures are going under a bit of threat at the moment. They're dying due to poisoning of carcasses. Also, a lot of them are flying into electrical lines, and so the numbers are not quite as much as what we would hope for. But about 15 to 20 years is mostly what we see from them here in the Sabi Sands. Obviously, that's quite generic across the five species that we do see. In fact, six species, if we include the Egyptian vulture in this area. In captivity, I, I believe there's been some that have recorded to go over 20. Um, but here, that would be very uncommon in the wild. It's generally the case with any wild animals that you have a situation where wild animals will be far less able to survive longer because of how hard the rigors of being in the wild are. Now it's interesting what I was watching now, the little cub was dragging the carcass and mom stepped in and just kind of chased it away from where it was and is now busy feeding herself. So she's kind of pulled the carcass off from where the cub was and the poor little cub is now sitting watching mom feed which is not ideal for that little one. The interesting thing though is if you look at the cubs they are so full and so round but if you look at the adult females not nearly as much as what the cubs are so their bellies aren't as round so they've obviously let the cubs feed more than anything else and they'll then clean up what's left. They would have got at least a little bit of a meal but the cubs are more important they need the nutrition and so you'll find that they'll let those cubs feed quite a bit as well and that water buck is small and now that we can see the rib cage it's a baby water buck so I'm sure that that other water buck, water buck that we saw watching is potentially its mother that's just watching what's going on unfortunately Jared's buddy are you saying that I mentioned that these cubs are on the small side um, well, I didn't mean that they were on the small side in terms of in relation to other cubs. They're pretty normal for their ages. Um, I was just mentioning small cubs as in relation to the other cubs within the pride. So there's two older cubs that are bigger, and then there's the four younger, smaller cubs that are those ones. Well, that's actually the adult female, but behind them is the two older ones, and then there's the four smaller ones that are around as well. Why are you growling at us? So one of the females has just growled at us. I don't know, maybe there's another cub edging in behind there. It's, it's very strange for a lioness to growl. So in relation to the Inkuhuma cubs, though, they are probably very similar at the same sort of age. There's not too much difference between them. They definitely are not in any way too small or, or not, not developed enough. They're pretty healthy and pretty regular or average for their age so they're, they're not massive and they're not small they're okay and the mange won't influence their size remember mange is just influencing their coat and also influencing um, their their ability to hold on to water so they dehydrate very quickly when they've got mange and so you'll find that these guys that's part of the reason why they die is they actually get into a situation where they dehydrate quite a bit so it's not going to affect their size though as long as they're getting food and they're getting nutrients they're going to be absolutely fine and they will grow just like any other lion cubs would I didn't do it, they most definitely will eat the hide and the skin. If you look at that carcass and you look around, there's no skin or hide anywhere to be seen. So a waterbuck has a very th hairy, very sort of thick 
fur and you can see the fur is all around so they they will lick the fur off and pull the fur off with their teeth but they will not worry about um, eating the skin they will eat the skin or the hide of this animal it's got nutrition there's a bit of a fat layer on it and there's there's lots to be gained from eating that so they definitely will eat that hide they just try and avoid eating the fur so they'll lick the fur off or try and bite the fur off using those front teeth um, but the hide itself they will definitely consume you'll be surprised how much of this they're going to eat so you'll find that the females will even crunch through those rib bones a little bit and maybe even some of the leg bones and then the hyenas if they find this will pretty much clean up most of that the vultures will be left with very little unless they can get in before the hyenas arrive which I'm sure all these vultures will be hoping is the case but really good to see the sticks pride I didn't realize that they had a carcass this morning otherwise we would have come this way and it was nice to at least see the Nkuma pride but really good to see the sticks and and to see them at least feeding and the cubs I promise you are looking a lot better than what they were the last time I saw them so it's amazing what a little meal does it makes them definitely look a lot fuller and healthier and I'm sure at some point how is that one lying that one almost looks as though it's got its legs spread out on either side and it's just kind of flat tummy <laughs> on its belly what are you doing little one but that is as round as it is tall at this stage there we go that looks more comfy Mr. Crowley, lions um, surviving without food is, is obviously dependent on what they ate last and how much of it they got. So it's, it's about two weeks that they, until they are absolutely emaciated and are really battling to find food. And the, the problem with a lion is as it gets more and more starving and it gets weaker and weaker and harder and harder for it to hunt. So about two weeks without food and you'll find that that cat is emaciated and really starting to become very weak and the chances of it surviving is quite slim um, but for the most part like I say it, it also depends on, on conditions and, and if it's hot or if it's cold or um, how far it's having to move given other lions in that area because that will also consume its energy but two weeks is a, is a rough sort of estimate as to when they desperate desperate desperately will need food I have seen a, a lion that went two and a half weeks without food it was literally wasted away but then it got a meal and actually bounced back from there so you, they can go I would say maybe three weeks at the most but two weeks is about the sort of average for lions and a meal like this for this female you can see she's not exactly full she doesn't have a big round tummy at all not like the cubs so she would be after two weeks of not eating would be absolutely famished she would be really kind of wasting away so they at the end of the day will consume their own body when they're basically starving so their muscles start to break down and the body like I say basically eats itself to try and survive and so muscle atrophy is huge and the condition then weakens and it becomes harder and harder for them to come back from that now we're going to sit with our sticks pride probably a little bit longer there are quite a few people that want to come here at the end of the day Chitwe has quite a number of different lodges that traverse this area and so while our female plays with the shoulder blade or the hip joint i can't decide which let's go to brent who's got his own lions on his own kill Well, imagine this. While the rain was pouring down, the Angama pride took advantage. Of course, the animals would not have been able to see them approaching, and they, I can't see what they've killed, but they've killed something. So we've just opened up the one side of our uh, our vehicle to show you the Angama pride looking very happy. The cubs were quite full this morning, but the lionesses were hungry. Now, I'm pretty sure they, they used, as that big storm came in, they moved out into the short grass and took advantage of an animal that couldn't see them coming through that wall of water. Water. Now, I don't know how long we're going to be able to stay here. There is more rain on the way, so we will stay for as long as possible. But isn't this exciting? Where there's a will, there's a way. We meandered about 400 meters from where we've been sitting, uh, waiting for the rain to go, and the Angamas have made a kill. And it's quite fresh, I would say. We probably missed it. It was while we were sitting tight, waiting for the rain to abate, um, that they caught this. I think they would have caught this probably in the sort of eye of the storm. A 
Francis from Israel says, wow, another kill. Wow, indeed. These girls have got 12 hungry cubs to keep well fed, and they're doing a spectacular job of that. Alicia says, these cats are better groomed, I assume you're comparing them to the poor Sticks Pride. Um, <laughs> and they're better groomed because they've got a better diet, generally, or a bit of an easier diet. Um, and uh, a lot of the animals here will be in better condition uh, than Juma at the moment because it is sort of the small ra beginning of the small rains. There's lots of lovely green grass. So the animals that the lions are eating here are in prime condition, where there is in, at Juma, you're coming right out of the end of dry season. So the animals will be suffering a little bit from condition. Ooh. There's a little bit of a family disagreement about who gets the tasty last piece of liver. Well, Rebecca is wondering how long will it take them to eat the whole animal. Rebecca, I can't see what animal this is, but it's probably nearly done already. Um, and there's just a pile of lions on top of it, uh, hence we can't see what it is. Now, quite funny. Um, and some of you might have seen on Twitter or on Instagram or even on Facebook, um, I put up a little video of the road we took to get here. Uh, the road is a river. Um, and we nearly got stuck while I, cause I was, uh, was fiddling around making a video. But, uh, well, unfortunately, we managed to not get stuck. Uh, we are about halfway up the river road. And uh, we will try and continue up it a little bit later. As I said, yeah, there is some more rain coming in. You can probably still hear the pitter-patter of raindrops on our roof. Kylie is wondering, how does the blood not permanently stain their fur? Well, Kylie, what happens is they will lick it off. Um, other lions will help them groom it, um, and it just comes off quite quickly. It comes off their fur. Now, we're quite lucky the lions have moved to where they are now. From if we had to drive the road that they were on this morning, it was, uh, we would certainly have got very, very stuck. Now, if it stays like this, we should be okay to sit here for a while. Um, there was some more lightning to the south, but it, that's not where I'm too worried about. I'm actually worried about uh, there's another big storm directly behind final control. So I'm hoping that doesn't come down over us. And as I said, it's almost on cue. <laughs> Alicia says they still look slippery. Well, I'm sure they're absolutely soaked. They weren't able to sit and, oh, hungry. I thought it said slippery. Um, hungry, well, as I say, there are 12 lionesses. I don't think this was a particularly big kill, maybe a baby zebra. Um, as I say, it's very difficult for us to see what it is when the lions are all scrummaging uh, to try and get a tasty treat. Um, and the females will let the cubs eat first. And... Um, they don't look too bad. Uh, I mean, the females were a little bit hungry this morning. They weren't starving by any means, um, but the, the cubs are greedy guts. Uh, the older the cubs get, uh, the less tolerant the, the ladies will be uh, of them scoffing most of the meal. And they'll get the odd clip around the ears and to remind them that they're not quite b b big big bosses yet. Yeah, you can see. She, she, she's fed, but she's not, not well fed. Rebecca is wondering when do lion cubs get their big teeth? They lose their milk teeth at about six months old, and that's also when the females wean them. Uh, of course, once they get those adult teeth, oof. there was a, a, a big lightning strike in the distance. Um, but once, uh, once they are weaned uh, at that, as soon as they start getting their adult teeth, uh, the females will wean them off milk, uh, of course, because uh, those adult teeth could probably do some damage to mom.
Stevie is wondering how many kills a day do they have to make to feed all 12 cubs and themselves? Well, they probably don't kill every day, Stevie. Probably every second day or every third day. Uh, lions can go quite a few days without without eating. Can we see what it is yet? No. Just the old rib popping up. Now, lions have the most atrocious table manners. Absolute free for all. Oof, can you hear the cub? Mine! Mine! Christine is wondering, are there any male cubs in this group? Uh, definitely one, because I saw him this morning. I haven't spent as much time with Angama Pride as, as a lot of the other uh, presenters. Uh, so I, I, I know there's definitely, I think there's probably, there's definitely one, and so probably a few more. Um, oof. Grumpy guts. <laughs> It's amazing how quickly some of these cubs have grown since we arrived here. Rex is wondering how old are the cubs when they learn to hunt? Rex, that's the thing, and a lot of people assume lions have to learn. They don't. Hunting is instinctive. It is inbred in them. They are killing machines. They have evolved to be like that. <laughs> but by the time they actually start being effective members of the 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 hunt, um, probably around two years old. Now, they will hunt and stalk lots, insects, butterflies, lots of little things up until then. And, and, and they sometimes are quite successful in catching, uh, but they're not really, they tend to mess up a lot of hunts. But the best way, well, there's a lot of people who think you need to teach a lion to hunt, and all you, as a, the best way to describe it is all you need to do is let the lion get hungry, and it will catch something. It could even be you. Well, our girls aren't that fat, so they might take advantage of this cold, rainy, windy weather to hunt again uh, once they've finished scoffing, whatever that might be. But it sounds like Tristan's lions are as fat and as lazy as a whale. Well, they are very fat and lazy, Brenty. Although we had a little cub that was up on the tree. It was super cool. He was lying on the log. It was almost leopard-like in the way that it was looking. So it was a very cool little picture to see this little lion cub resting on top of the tree. It was really quite pretty. And we had the perfect light on it at one time. And in the background, you can see there's one that's playing a game of hide-and-seek behind the termite mound. You can just see a little head popping out from behind there. There we go. He see you, little one. What are you doing behind there? It's, like I say, a bit sleepy, almost using that termite mound to block itself from the wind. The wind is coming from that direction, so it's actually doing a good job of being blocked. And the rest of them are strewn out by the two cubs that are feeding with the female. You can see they've dragged the carcass quite far around now. And so they're just having a last little feed on that. I, I reckon they're going to abandon this carcass tonight. I don't think they'll still be here tomorrow by any stretch of the imagination. I don't think they'll go far, but they're definitely not going to be still on the carcass. There'll be very little left by an hour or two's time. You can see they're already just cleaning up the bones, licking off the little bits of meat using those rough tongues and trying to get as much kind of out of it as possible. But there really isn't very much left anymore. The females if they decide to feed the two of them are going to clean that up very quickly but what a wonderful sighting with the stick sprite uh, an unexpected one as well so not only is it good but it's also unexpected i didn't think we would see the stick sprite it's they've been especially now with the new cubs i would have thought that they might be spending most of their time to the south of us or where they've got the cubs on vessels and the nets property and so it's a nice surprise that they've moved up this way and are at least on Chitwa and hopefully we'll see a lot of them over the next few months as if they spend time around Chitwa area and then also coming every now and then into Vuatela. They've been seen three times in the last month on Vuatela which is 
interesting because prior to that it was a long long period that we went without seeing the sticks pride anywhere near Buyatela camp so or even on Juma anywhere and so it's been nice that they've been sort of poking their nose in around twin dams and spending a bit of time in that area it certainly is a nice surprise when we get them every now and then and like I say they are a little bit sort of mangy and not as good looking as the Nkuma pride but they are a pride steeped with history this pride has been in the area and, and in the Sabi sand and known by a lot of people for as long as the Sabi sands has really had tourists coming in so they were one of the first prides that was ever sort of named and ever followed and so they have got a lot of history and in my time here in the Sabi sands unfortunately I've watched this pride just get decimated by the rolling coalitions So Michael, you're asking if I know how successful the sticks have been at raising cubs. Well, the answer to that is in the time that I've known them, pretty horrific. As I was saying, they've really had a tough time of it. They've had a number of coalitions come through and they've just really battled to keep their cubs alive. So when I first started, there was 11 adult lions in the sticks pride. There was, well, when I say adult, there was a couple sub-adults and, and a sub-adult male. The sub-adult male then went off on his own, unfortunately ended up with a dislocated hip and a very badly injured face and he unfortunately succumbed to those injuries and then since then they've really struggled to raise any cubs there's been one young female that's been raised and other than that nothing 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 they've lost pretty much the majority of their cubs and this hopefully will mean that there's going to be a little bit more of success when it comes to cubs this year hopefully we're going to end up with a situation where we get some little ones making it and and this kind of strengthens the pride because at the end of the day the three females are all fairly on the older side they're not young individuals and so you know it would be nice if we get some females that last and that the continuation of the sticks pride can happen and we end up with the pride rebuilding and becoming the strength that it once was it it's it's sad when i see the sticks pride i always feel sorry for them they've they've really been battered hard and they were first hit by the Mpohos, then they were hit by the Majingalans, then the Matimbas, and then after that the Birmingham. So they've really gone through a lot of male coalitions, and that's all since 2010. So in seven years they've dealt with four male lion coalitions, and if you work out that cubs generally are only kind of adults at a, or left alone by the males between two and a half and three you can work out very quickly that four coalitions in in seven years means that they've just not had time to raise any of their cubs before the new males come in and kill all those cubs so they've really struggled and i'm hoping that this is a bit of change of luck the birmingham's are young males they've done really well and so i'm pretty sure that we're going to be in a situation where they hopefully will be able to survive and to be able to grow and become big adults and once again build the sticks pride into a powerful force that it should be but look at the size of the belly of that little cub that's lying down like i say his belly is bigger than it is tall basically it's just round and big and you can see a little bit of callousing of the mange but it's actually like i say a lot better than the last time i saw these little ones they're looking really in much better condition Stevie, the only part of the prey that they don't go after is bones that are too big for them. So sometimes leg bones and, and vertebra and then also the stomach content itself. So they won't eat the rumen of this animal. But otherwise everything else is fair game. You'll find that they'll go after rib bones, they'll, they'll eat the hides, they'll eat organs, they eat um, any of the meat obviously. They'll, they'll eat the eyes, they'll eat the ears. You can see she's actually busy feeding on the ear at the moment. I think that was the last bit of the ear that went down the gullet just now so pretty much everything other than the big bones that they really battle to be able to consume and then of course um, the hair they also don't like to eat so they'll try and pluck the hair and get rid of that so they don't have to deal with that but this wind is really not dying down I thought it would but it seems to be just carrying on and really going a bit crazy still so I was hoping we would see the end of it this evening but that doesn't seem like it's going to happen it seems as though we're going to be punished by wind a little bit longer and we're going to really have a rough night of it in the end of the day it's not going to be as pleasant as I thought it would be I wanted it to be a nice beautiful calm evening because that would have been a wonderful way to so Lou you reckon a bush kite and go fly it I reckon 
either that or imagine trying to fly a vulture that would be quite crazy so you wouldn't want to add anything to a vulture and try and follow them because they are moving around all over the place at the moment we're seeing them kind of jumping around and flying in and the speed at which they move when the wind takes them is quite incredible so forget a bush kite let's have a bush vulture that we can operate or better yet a drone would be quite cool a drone would have been a very cool way to have watched what was going on so hopefully at some stage soon we'll unleash the drone again but here comes a vulture look at this how cool is that and it's going to just slowly float upwards and then it will open the wings and slow right down and land there we go not the softest of landing that particular one and in fact it even landed on a small branch that i th thought might fall imagine if one of these lions got a branch to the head that would certainly not impress them at all given that they can't get to those vultures but <laughs> I'm also watching very carefully for one of them that's about to defecate because I feel like these lions are in danger of being defecated on by vultures and I can assure you I've seen somebody being defecated on by a vulture it is not a funny experience it is a lot of lot that comes out of a vulture's back end and causes quite a big mess so if I was a lion I'd be very careful where I was sitting right now they're right in the firing line for these vultures at the moment and hopefully they'll be okay and they won't end up with a situation where they're going to end up with some well the proverbial egg on the face as they say is that one fallen asleep on the carcass it looks like it has looks like there's a little one that's decided to have a little nap on the carcass Nancy, you asking if vultures ever make their own kills or do they wait for others to do it? Well, Nancy, they pretty much are, are scavengers. They do not kill things for themselves. I've never seen a vulture kill anything. Most of the time, well, 100% of the time, they are scavenging off carcasses of other individuals. So they're going to things like this, lion carcasses or animals that have died and then feeding off those. So they are scavengers out and out. They're not designed to be able to feed on the wing or to be able to catch their own prey items. And so you'll find them pretty much just going from carcass to carcass. And you must remember, there are a lot of carcasses in the bush. There's a lot of things that die regularly and there's some really large carcasses. So things like elephants and hippos and buffalo, um, when they die, that's food for a long period. And sometimes those don't get found by lions if they die of natural causes and the vultures can have an absolute field day. So there's more than enough for them to survive as scavengers out here. And it's unfortunately why their numbers have declined somewhat but look i love how the hooded vultures run around like i say they're the most brazen of all of them so they'll try to come in here and see if they can steal a little morsel from somewhere i wonder if the lion that's behind the termite mound is about to give this vulture a big surprise because it's slowly but surely heading towards the termite mound where our little lion is tucked away and I don't know if that vulture has seen that lion but it'll be funny if it doesn't go see that lion and that lion comes bursting around and chasing them off right but unfortunately we're going to have to start moving on because there are others that want to come into the sighting so I'm going to leave the sticks pride now let them finish off their water buck kill and we're going to start heading across towards the Inkuma pride so hopefully that we can get the Birmingham's roaring as the sun sets but while we do that let's go back to Brent and his feasting lions all the way on the other side of Africa well I think there's not much left and we still haven't quite managed to work out what the Angamas are munching upon um, just from what was around here this morning, I think it's probably a young zebra, but <laughs> they are really getting stuck in there. And you can hear the pitter-patter of rain on the roof. It's still raining, so we're sitting nice and dry, just the one side open uh, at the moment, and the rain coming in from the northwest of us. And I think these lions uh, might not get all they need out of this meal. Uh, the cubs will probably do okay. The females might be a little bit hungry still afterwards. Oh, I saw a poof there. Maybe it was a young wildebeest, one of the lost souls that run around the Mara going, meh, meh, meh. It is absolutely 
wonderful that they did manage to catch something. Oh, little one, what are you whining at? I'm still hungry, Mum. Still hungry. I'm too small to get in there. All the big ones are in the way. Oh, although that belly is so big, I don't think it could fit another morsel in. Look at it wobble as it walks. Sweetness. You'll notice that uh, in some circumstances they'll lick their paws um, after they've got blood and stuff on them. That's to clean them um, and as well with that one there, uh, he's probably actually got a little piece of meat. There we go, there we go, he does indeed. Now, it sometimes looks like they're licking uh, his, his own leg but he's actually found uh, something good to eat. So there's not much meat left on anything right now. Lots and lots of growling and growling. What has he got? Maybe we can identify. Oh, we're not going to identify what animal it is from a lung. <laughs> it is a lung, though, I can tell you that much. Well done, mister. A whole lung to yourself. Quite a sizable lung, actually, so maybe it was something a bit bigger than we thought. The animals were just, the lions were just just quite hungry. Alicia's wondering how many lion cubs are in a single litter. Um, your average is between one and three. Uh, the largest litter ever recorded, if I remember correctly, is eight, and that was from In the Wild, um, which was in Nairobi National Park in Kenya. So generally, the uh, average lion litter size is between one and three, and the largest litter ever recorded is eight. And and that was in Kenya as well. Now, remember, for those of you who might not believe, we are coming to you from a rain-soaked Maasai Mara, 100% live, so you're witnessing this at the exact same time as we are. really wonder what that is. Um, it is quite a mystery what they are munching upon at the moment. I'm just trying to see. I saw a hoof there. I think it could be a wildebeest. Um, there were a few wildebeest in this area earlier today. Um, it could also be a zebra. It's, it's, I'm not 100% sure. And at the moment, I might ask Fergus to go poke his nose in there between the lines to see what's what. Not not, no, Fergus not hungry. Oh, no, he could eat, just not... Not with them. Oh, there's that one of the little ones with that very fat belly again. Oh, fatty, trying to get in there. Ark's asking, what are the pockets for on the side of a lion's ears? I assume you're just referring to the little indentation that, like we have in our ears. Um, it, it will be there to, to try and catch certain sounds. Um, and also they have quite a lot of hair in their ear to protect, but their hearing is phenomenal. Oh, speaking of sounds, you can hear a hyena in the distance. Whoop. Higher up the mountain, up the road that is the river. There's a little boy. As I said, there's at least one, and probably a few more. As I said, I haven't spent as much time with this pride as uh, the other presenters. Who 
can you get? Now, normally, they would struggle to catch something in grass this short, but that massive storm that was here a little bit earlier, that obviously aided them. Uh, and the fact that they were able to sneak up upon whatever unsuspecting critter uh, this was. I'm thinking wildebeest. I saw it look like a black leg and hoof briefly in jaws of one of the lions. CJ is now asking me quite a difficult question. Um, CJ is wondering, what is my favorite pride? And uh, CJ, oh, that is so difficult. I I think, oh, you're putting me on the spot now, CJ. I think in the triangle itself, my favorite pride is the Salt Lake Pride. But what about the Purungut Pride? So the Purungut Pride is definitely one of my favorites. They, they operate on both uh, sides of the river, uh, around Purungut Bridge, Lookout Hill. That I think, and I spend a lot of time with them. I've got a soft spot for the Sailor's Pride. I like the Rongkai Pride. Oh, I like the Ridge Pride. I like the Paradise Pride. Now, a lot of you are going to probably disagree with me about who my favorite male coalition of lions is. I know a lot of you are probably going, Musketeers, Musketeers, Musketeers. And I go, Bah humbug, Musketeers. I'm a Billa Shaka man. So I think those six male lions are going to be absolutely fantastic. So that's my favorite coalition of male lions, the six young male lions that are spending a lot of time around the marsh. What have you spotted, Lady Lion? I need to duck down from my seat. What is out there? She's got quite a little bit of uh, intent. Let me see, where are my binoculars now? It could be a hyena wandering in. It could be potential prey. Oh, hyena's making lots of noise. Ooh. I'm not sure what she's seen. I can't see anything. Riti is wondering if hyenas decided to charge in here and attempt to steal the meal, who would win the fight? Now, uh, from chatting to the Mara lion researchers and the Mara hyena researchers, uh, it generally takes about three hyenas per adult lioness. Sorry, four, no, Mara is five hyenas per adult lioness. So you would need, there's four adult lionesses here. So you'd need 20 hyenas. So it's all a numbers game. And with a kill that's probably like this with very little left uh, and with all the cubs around, they might just abandon it from a safety point of view for the youngsters. I have no idea what she's looking at. I'm following her eye line down towards the trees. can't see anything apart from trees, some grass. There you go, time for a bath. Oh, there we go, they're pulling the carcass, we might be able to see what it is. Oh, bit of an argument. Rishi's wondering if there's a size difference between the lions and the Mara and Juma. I would say a very, very minimal one. I'd say I'd say the lions here are, are stockier, probably heavier, but not necessarily taller. Oh, is it a wildebeest? No, it's a pig. It's a warthog. Is it a warthog? You can just see a schnoz. I think what looks to be a warthog schnoz. Yeah, it's a warthog. Oh, big male warthog as well. I mean, that's why it's such a hefty set of lungs inside him. That is a massive male warthog. Probably caught the poor, poor, poor pig on its way trying to get down its hole. When it was raining, he wanted to go home. Or oh, the amount of rain we had flooded the pig out of his hole during the rain and led him into lions. Oh, 
And one line is, oh, she stopped looking again, but she keeps looking up. I have another quick scan with my binoculars. There's some elephants in the distance, that's about it. And quite a long way away. Yeah, she's looking again, maybe she's hearing something. Now, while we're sitting in the rain, I did hear some, what sounded to be male lions roaring um, off in that direction. Who knows, maybe they're on their way up, on their way up here. And a little bit less aggression. I'd say there's almost zero pork left on that on that carcass. And they have managed to completely eat the whole pig. Now it seems to be a very, very much a lion evening. Uh, Tristan's been with the sticks. I've been with uh, the Yangamas after the rain. And it sounds like Tristan's on his way to yet more lions. Well, I, th I was thinking I might head towards the Birmingham boys and Nkumas because I would love to hear the whole pride roaring. And I have a funny feeling that the Birminghams might roar. It's a long shot and maybe it won't happen, but you know, I think it will be worth a try. The, the sticks are all but finished, that water buck. And like I said, there's other people that wanted to come in and have a look. So we did spend a decent amount of time there and it was really nice to see them. But we have to give some of the others a chance as well. That's the nice thing about being out here is that we all help each other and that makes life a lot easier. So we'll go and have a little quick look at the Nkuma Pride and hope and hope that the Birmingham's roar and that the rest of the Pride joins in. It'll be something wonderful to listen to them all going at the same time. I'm just going to let one of the vehicles come past. And so it's another one of our good friends, which is Darby from Elephant Plains. And I haven't seen Darby in a long time. Hello, bud. Yeah. I'll see you later. Cool. Cheers, bud. Good to see you again, bud. Yeah. I'll chat to you soon. So, like I say, nice to see Darby again. I haven't seen him in so long, and he's, uh, he's one of my good friends out here, so always nice to catch up with the guys. Um, Eric the Poet, he wanted to know how the, stick, well, the Sticks Pride got their ancient Greek name. Well, basically, there's a section on Mala Mala called Styx, uh, or a farm that's called Styx. Why it was called Styx in the first place, I'm not quite sure. It seems as though all the, the farms, if, uh, what we deem as farms, but let's say sections of the Sabi Sands, all of them have these really old school names. So we've got Raven's Court and Sparta and Styx and Toulon and uh, what else have we got? Marth, Ottawa, uh, um, Alice uh, Wallingford, so there's all these um, older names around here. Gowrie is another one. Um, so that's where it comes from. It's just an area on Mala Mala that they got this, the name Styx. Um, and there's no river system or anything like that that's caused them to get it. It's just the way um, things have worked, an area that they inhabited. And like I say, they all. Okay, well, we're back. Um, seems like Tristan's found a gremlin or two. So we're back with the Angamas, and they're starting to uh, spread out a little bit from where they were munching on the warthog. Some of those cubs are absolutely filthy at the moment, covered in blood, guts, and gore, and in need of a good wash from mum. Uh, what is that cub scene? Is there a hyena on their way? It doesn't look like it. D 
Dory is wondering, how can a lioness feed eight cubs if she's only got four teats? Well, it's all about competition. So there would have been great competition between the cubs. Um, and one must remember the other thing about lions, um, being the only truly social cat, they are also practice aloe suckling. So other members of the pride would have suckled her, if they had babies, would also suckle her youngsters. So that is the... One of the reasons you often find a lot of cubs of the same age in a pride, a lot of the females are on a similar Easter cycle, and of course that makes it much easier for them to raise their young when they all uh, sort of have cubs around the same time and all of them are lactating so they can share the milk load, so to speak. Hello, Leah, who's eight years old. Leah is wondering, how long is a lioness pregnant for? They have a very short gestation period, uh, Leah, which is the fancy word for saying pregnant. Um, and it's, it's between 90 and 110 days. So very, very short, about three months. So it is a quarter of, no, a third. <laughs> My math is horrible there. A third of what a human's gestation period is. It seems like we have no more spitter patter on the roof. Oof. So Philip's wondering if a mom died, um, would other members of the pride let them suckle? They would, Philip. Um, uh, that's why I said it's uh, lions will suckle their young and others young. So it's not uncommon um, for if a female dies for one of the other members of her pride to take up the suckling. What do you want, little monster? Ow, do you do? Ow. <laughs> it is one of my favorite sounds. Nothing quite like little contact calls of cubs. Playtime. Hi, Carsten in Denmark. Carsten's wondering how much I think that warthog weighed. Uh, probably over a hundred kilograms, Carsten. A big male warthog can be a very hefty beast. And actually, sometimes quite a dangerous animal to take down, even for the lions, because of those incredibly sharp tushes, the bottom tusks that rub up against the top tusks, and, are, and they can be as sharp as a razor blade. As you can see, a little bit less arguing going on at the moment, uh, a little bit more friendly than they were when we first arrived. Now, Riti's wondering, do they eat bones or only flesh? Um, they'll eat both, and uh, gristle and everything in between, and uh, they will eat the smaller bones of course certain bones will be too big uh, especially some of the thicker leg bones and and some of the the, the vertebra will be too thick for even for the lions to crush but of course and we've always got the hyenas coming in afterwards who might make short work of said bones Is wondering, it says it seems that the animals out here are strictly herbivores and carnivores. Are there any omnivores? Uh, indeed, there are. There's quite a lot of omnivores, Philip. Um, wait, what was that? I thought I heard a jackal in the distance. Um, but 
little things like uh, genets, civets, uh, mongoose are omnivores, uh, baboons, monkeys, and uh, we've got what, three species, well, one species of baboon, three species of monkey, possibly in the Mara. Um, what other omnivores can I think of offhand? Polecats. Hmm. Yeah, so there are quite a few omnivores, but out of your, your bigger species, things are generally one or the other. So, it is getting a little bit darker. We're going to have to switch to infrared quite soon. So, while Fergus plays with lights and gets our camera ready for after dark, uh, let's go across to Tristan, who's still on his way to the Inkohumas. I am still on my way, Brent. I'm meandering. I'm potting about, enjoying Juma and the lack of wind that I feel on this road. It's a little thicker here than where I've been driving. I was on the main road, Gauri Main, and it was gusting and cold and horrid and bouncy and bumpy. It was really not very pleasant. So it's nice to be in a bit more of a thicker area and a little bit more of a smooth road. Not that this new road is any smoother than Gauri Main, actually, but it feels a bit more, I suppose. It's not as corrugated at least it's a bit bumpy but it's not as corrugated as what we saw or what we had on Gari Main but it's amazing how quickly the light is fading tonight we had sort of beautiful sunshine and then all of a sudden it's just gotten dark quite quickly and you can see there's a few ominous clouds still sticking around so it was separating and now it seems to have been coming back together again so not ideal but I suppose it would be nice for a bit of rain though tonight, wouldn't it? Just to spruce things up a little bit and get everything starting to green up again. It's very dry in this area. This grass is turning almost a translucent white color now rather than a yellow drab wintry color. Senzo, are you okay there? So Senzo I saw was fiddling with the aerial and Senzo and I once had an accident with an aerial while we were driving along so I was driving and I hit a bump as Senzo was trying to put the aerial down when he first started and it pinched his thumb and oh was, was it your thumb or your forefinger? It was your, it was your pinky finger that's right and it's made a nice nasty little gash on Senzo's thumb so now I'm always careful if I see Senzo looking at the aerial or antenna to ask if I need to stop but apparently all is good and we are fine we don't have to worry but that was not the finest moment from the two of us but we've since worked that one out and been able to communicate a little bit better as to what's going on but I always enjoy driving this road. It's got such a beautiful view of the Drakensberg Mountains off to the western side. And often you get nice sort of views of the mountains and the sunset. And it's a very pleasant road to drive. And, and we know that Shadow often spends time here. So I like driving it just for that reason. Is In case I get lucky and bump into her, it's for no other reason really. It's just to hope that I bump into Shadow in this area. It's always nice to, to find her and... and the thing is is that I haven't seen the cub in so long that I would like to see the little cub with her apparently it's it's doing fine I spoke to somebody who was it I don't remember that saw the cub about three four days ago so apparently it's doing okay and it's still with the shadow so that's all good news and she seems to be out of the sort of most dangerous period so I would imagine that shadow should theoretically raise this one to adulthood I say should because poor shadow has the worst luck in the world and so hopefully she'll be okay and she'll get her cub into adulthood and we'll see another little female out and about on drive I wonder how relaxed she is now. The last time I saw her, much better and was fairly chilled with us. Like she didn't worry too much about us and certainly didn't go too far and didn't run. It was a little bit nervous by itself, but it wasn't too bad once it was with mom. So hopefully it will start to settle down as it's getting older and feeling a little bit braver and a little bit more kind of confident in itself. But alas, no sign of her, no tracks, no...
Ah. So, Christine, my favorite season in the Sabi Sands is now happening as we speak. We're going September, October, November, my favorite time of the year. And the reason why is we come out of this cold winter, which I'm not a fan of cold. I like hot weather, and the hotter the better, really. And so I'm happy with the hotter weather. And, and also, we go out of cold, dry, drab, brown, sort of dusty into life-filled beautiful greens lots of baby animals everywhere lots of migratory birds and I love that transition from one to the other so the, now is my favorite time from winter to summer so this little short spring and the first little bit of summer is definitely for me the best time in the bushes it's amazing to watch everything just rejuvenate and come back to life after being sucked dry by the baking sun of winter and the dryness and you see all things thriving in those summer conditions and so I love that sort of process that happens and, and watching it unfold and watching these trees start to bud and flowers start to form and just a really a complete sort of difference in what you used to that's my favorite part about this time of the year and, and like I say there's lots of interesting things that arrive and things that you get excited about because you haven't seen them in six months so it's an excitable time and everybody kind of gets into the spirit of it and you find people start Start betting on when we're going to see the first baby impala, when we're going to see, you know, the first Wahlberg's eagle, when we're going to see the first um, woodland kingfisher, and so it's just there's lots of anticipation and lots of great things that come, and there's things to look forward to. I, I know a lot of other people love the winter times because generally the game viewing is better, and and yes, it is. It's much easier to find a lot of these animals because they spend a lot of time around water holes, but at the end of the day it is not as pretty and there's certainly far less to look at in the winter than there is in the summer and the summer I love it because there's so much to see and so many new things we get new insects new plants it's really quite nice ah patty you're wondering what date I think the first rains are going to come and have the crew started betting. Well, I had a bet with Sebastian. I can't remember the exact date. I think he said 8th of October and I said the 27th of September. I think that's about right. I, maybe somebody can remind me of what I said. So those are, I said 27th of September and the, the deal was that it has to be a solid rain. It can't be a little one millimeter or two millimeters of rain because we measure our rain in millimeters. So it had to be a really solid, so 20 mils. 20 mils was the cutoff, Lou. So we need Lou and Megan to get involved, and today's the perfect day. Lou, Megan, what are your predictions for when the rain is going to come? And Senza, when do you think the rain is going to come? You're going to be the last one. So we have to wait for Megan and Lou first. Okay. No, no, you can't now look up on weather apps and things in FC. You've got to come up instantly. It's got to be a quick answer, because I'm now here stand by, which I know what that means. Megan, 2nd of October, and Lou, the 18th of October. Okay, so 2nd of October, 18th of October, 8th of October for Sebastian, 27th of September for Tristan, and 10 of October. So I'm the only September boy. Watch, let's see the space. It's going to be interesting, and it's got to be a 20 millimeter or more rain that we get in this area. Hopefully it's going to be sooner rather than later. I wonder if anybody else wants to predict hashtag Safari Live predictions. When we're we going to get our first rains? 10 of October. 10 of October. You, you're winning. What's the bet, Senzo? What are we going to give each other? Okay. We can get you some more socks if you want. Some nice socks. Yeah, we can or we can bet a six pack of apple juice. Maybe a six pack of apple juice to the winner. There we go. All the rest of the crew has to owe, everyone has to get a six pack of apple juice to whoever wins out of the crew. Each, everybody, each one six pack. Senzo's date, Lou, was the 10th of October. Sebastian, the 8th of October, if I remember correctly. And then me, the 27th of September. So we'll note those all down. I don't know if Brent wants to take a stab at it. Not that we'll get our six pack of apple juice anytime soon because Brent's going to be in the Mara for still quite some time. And so <laughs> I doubt that they'll even make it past his tent if he did have to buy them. So hopefully <laughs> we'll leave him out of that one for now. And we, well, the Mara, we'll guess, if you had to guess rain in the Mara, you'd just say later on tonight at this rate. <laughs> so Senzo's having a bit of a laugh behind me. 
But I, I would imagine, I think we're going to get it sooner or later. This build-up in heat that we've had, it can only mean that we're going to start getting rain at some point. It's got to, at some point, start to come to fruition. Are you, Mike? You will. Thanks, buddy. So it's going to, at some point, have to break, and, and the heat has to give way to some sort of rain. And if it's anything like last year, we had that rainstorm of about 20 mils just at the end of September, and that's going to put the little cat amongst the pigeons and make me, well, a apple juice rich man. So let's see how we go. And it's of course is closest to the date and the interesting the, the interesting part about it is all the others have gone very close together. Jason, you 29th of September. Jason, I, you with me. We're on the right path here. We're going to be the winners in this particular situation. I'm sure of it. We're going to be the ones that are going to get this right. Now, the in, nice thing is that the Inkuhuma Pride seems to all be head up. Francis, you say 1st of October. Hmm, Francis, I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see who's going to be right. I think a lot of you have gone in October too close together because now you don't give yourself any room for winning because at least with me if it's slightly earlier in September I've got it all to myself nobody else is going to have anything to do with me if it's earlier in September and if it's in even early October I'm pretty close as well. I think Megan's probably the closest to me at, at this stage the interesting thing in Kahuma Pride every single one has got head up at the moment so they all are awake there's a bit of yawning from Amber Eyes which I think means we're about to go on a bit of a march I see him Fumo in the background is starting to yawn his head is up so I reckon we're going to start sort of moving shortly the problem is is that we're right up against the boundary and so the chances of us keeping up with them there's Tinio has now popped up his head in the background you see one of the lionesses moving here we go so I think we've arrived just at the right time to see our lionesses start going on the prowl the problem is like I say if they head in this you know, they are already heading the way that I thought they were going to and that's the wrong way for us they will cross within the next 10 minutes if they go the way they're going and Amber is typically in front taking them from this area and heading southwards and we know there were some impalas around hello girls are you coming to say hello you can see they're just drifting right in front, not perturbed by us at all. And typical to see these two first moving. It's always amber eyes and the younger female that tend to go first. So I think this is the youngest female with the suckle marks in front of me. I might be wrong. I'm just trying to see. No, it's not. Sorry, it's not the youngest female. The youngest female will come fairly shortly. There she is. She's at the back over there, the one that's busy grooming her back. You can see the milk underneath and her teats so the suckle marks so that's the youngest female that generally follows amber eyes so as soon as amber eyes moves but she looks like she's stalking something look at her posture amber eyes has gone into a stalk posture look at her the way that she's walking she's head down look lowering that head looking forward i wonder if she spotted something nope now she's going to go to the toilet even if she has spotted something the bush calls and nature calls and she's got to quickly go to the toilet and make sure that she just gets that out of the way before any serious hunting takes place oh no back down we go here comes the other two so they're coming and I think here comes the injured female so you want to see how she's walking if you didn't believe me that she was walking fine even though she's got that injury she's got a little bit of a limp but otherwise that is not a bad walking gait at all she's walking better than what I would have thought she would have managed with an injury as horrific as that she really is doing a lot better than I would have thought, but it is a nasty, nasty injury that, and hopefully it will heal, but it looks horrible. You can actually even see the muscles as she moves past us. It really is sore. Oh, that's not very pleasant. Shame, my girl. That must be very painful. But the fact that she's not limping is absolutely incredible to me. Imagine how strong and how resilient they are to be able to walk with a wound like that and not even have any stiffness remember she's been lying down all day and yet no stiffness in that walk at all it's absolutely phenomenal i don't understand how these animals deal with it like i say if that was a human you would be man down woman down you would be in serious pain and not very happy about life at all so it's pretty incredible that they're managing to well she's managing to walk the way she is at the moment 
the good thing though the, the the saving grace for us today and and hopefully why the lines will stay here on Juma is that the wind is now shifted and it's coming from a south easterly direction so lions like to walk into the wind they don't like to walk with the wind blowing over their shoulder so i don't think they're going to go to arethusa i think they might start cutting back towards juma to the central parts which is fantastic news for us so hopefully they're going to head that direction i see all the cubs are up now they're all starting to approach us the males are still lingering at the back and are busy grooming but it's this time of the day that things are going to start happening and we're going to start to see the Inkuuma pride starting to get going and I hope that they start hunting that buffalo herd I haven't gotten any more updates on the buffalo herd I'm not sure where they are and what they're doing but I'm pretty sure this pride is hungry they're looking for food the females are fairly skinny even the the cubs or sub adults are skinny they had a meal last night it must have been a very small meal and the boys must have stolen most of what was going on Cindy Tennessee, you're asking if there's any prey animals that are more nutritious than others. Well, most of the prey animals that have really big layers of fat are good for them. So zebras, funny enough, have really thick yellow fat and that's highly nutritious for lions. So that's a good one to go after. Um, healthy buffalo are a good one, but unfortunately not many healthy buffalo around anymore. And droughts have really hammered them. And so then the only other one that's really nutritious meat is hippo. And hippos are very difficult to bring down. So I would imagine a situation that hippos are going to be fairly tough to find. Toby, you're asking if one of the lionesses has been mating. You thought you saw bite marks on the back of her neck. Well, Toby, I also noticed the same thing with amber eyes. does look like she has a few bite marks on the back of her neck, so I think maybe she has, and maybe that's why we've got two of the Birminghams with us at the moment. These boys are obviously picking up that there's some sort of Easter cycle somewhere here, and that's why they're coming into this area. But she definitely does have some signs, but you can see they are mobile again, and they're definitely spotting something to the south of us. Maybe that impala herd that we saw earlier today that is there, I didn't see any when I came in, but I could be wrong. Maybe the impala herd is somewhere and they're going to start stalking. Look, you can see they, there's some intent in what they're doing, the way that they're stopping, the way that they're staring. They're looking very, very intently to the south, so maybe there is something in that area that they're seeing. We're going to stay here because I want the boys to come walking past and meandering past us. They will eventually. As soon as those females walk like this, the boys generally are not far behind and coming and looking and giving the attention that they need. So I'm pretty sure we're going to end up with the boys coming this way. Ermi from Germany, you're asking if I'm able to identify the floppy-eared cub. Not. I am not, unfortunately. The reason why is because when I got here, the floppy-eared cub's ear was all right again. So I, I believe it was a younger one. So it could be that one that's further back there, but I'm not 100% sure at all. Um, I know a lot of the viewers know exactly which one it is, and maybe they'll help us out. But I'm not 100% sure at all which one it is. Um, it was before my time that it had the floppy ear, and I, and I only got to see the Nkuma pride once I came to Safari Live. Remember when they had these small cubs and that ear was floppy, this pride was only on Juma. They didn't move off Juma and we saw very little of them at Simamili. It's only once I got here that they started to go to Simamili all the time. So I'm not 100% sure which one is the floppy eared cub. Um, maybe some of you guys can help us as to exactly which one. I, I have an idea if maybe is the one at the back there. There's one right behind a stump. The, that one that's sitting at the back, it might be that one, but I'm not 100% sure. Is it the floppy-eared one? Is that the one with the amber eyes? Maybe somebody can help us and let me know what they think as to whether it's the one with the, the amber-colored eyes or if it isn't. But the lionesses are stretched in a long, long line now. they all looking around. I think we're going to see the boys coming shortly. I don't think the boys are going to let the females get out of sight there's Tinio is just having a sneeze in the back. There comes another one of the sub adults.
pretty amazing to be in such close proximity to them and just watching them filing past. Here comes the last of the Cubs and I reckon then after that we're going to start to see the boys rolling past as well. See him Fumo starting to yawn. Mega Man, you're asking when were lions habituated to humans as in when were they, did they not attack humans and what tactics were used to get them that way? Well, Mega Man is quite simple, when we stopped hunting them. So as soon as we had a situation where we weren't hunting lions anymore and we weren't killing them, stealing food from them because people actually used to chase them off their carcasses and steal from them. So as soon as we stopped doing that, then you'll find that they started to relax already around those situations. It also took probably a, a lot of time when they had food that you'd park far away, watch them, observe them, and slowly but surely they got used to the vehicles and used to us. Remember that lions inherently don't just attack people. They don't come running at people and killing them even back in the day it was only because people hunted them and people hurt them that they were aggressive otherwise they would have been absolutely fine and it would have been a situation that we wouldn't have had to worry about them but they learned behavior that they had to defend themselves and protect themselves and once they've eaten somebody the, the meat then obviously they can taste that and they know that we are then a soft target we're slow we're not very fast we're soft we don't have sharp teeth we don't have sharp claws we don't have horns and so we're an easy target for lions and that's why they would have come after after us and would have ended up chasing people and eating them but they inherently are scared of people and most of the time they'll move away from you and so over time now in these reserve areas because we haven't hunted them because we haven't gone after them they've now become very relaxed around the vehicles and they've learned as cubs to see vehicles and that that's it now we're going to follow this in Kahuma pride they are heading south quite quickly now and the boys I'm surprised haven't gotten up to move yet they're still busy with their grooming and it is windy and cold and it's the perfect conditions for hunting but I believe the Mara is also dark and stormy and I'm sure the lions are gonna have a field day that side oh, welcome back everyone so the road that was a river is now a stream and I'm trying to negotiate my way up the stream oh frog don't make life difficult for me. Um, and you'll see that I'm not in color. There's a reason for this. Ferg's got it um, in that low light setting. Because if we put on the light, it reflects off the windscreen and I can't see where I'm going. Not that I do much of a good job when I can see where I'm going. Um, but, well, there we go, we're driving sideways. <laughs> um, very, very slippery, this black cotton soil. So we left the lions, uh, they're still munching on the last of the warthog, but we can see another big torrent of rain coming towards us. Um, and we don't want to get properly caught there because um, I think this road has deteriorated enough and too much more, there's not gonna be much of a road left. Oh, it's a very good question from Aiden who's six years old, Aiden would like to know if the animals get caught, or if it rains too much, uh, can the animals get caught in the mud? Now, Aiden, you would think that, but that actually happens when it doesn't rain enough. So what happens, the water holes will dry up and the animals are so desperate for a drink that they'll go into the mud and then they get stuck in the mud. When it rains a lot like this, the animals will stay away from the mud because there's lots of little puddles of water everywhere where they can get a drink. Oh, hold on. Uh, so they don't, oh, hold on. Sorry, Aiden, I had to just concentrate on driving there for a second. Still concentrating. Uh, there we go. Uh, through we go, the mud. Um, so it's actually the opposite. So when it doesn't rain enough, uh, the animals get caught in, in the mud. But when it rains like this, there's lots of little puddles for them to drink everywhere. So it's, it's better. Ooh, we've got a soft spot coming up. Is everyone holding on? Oh, it wasn't that bad. Hi, Lucy. Uh, Lucy says, when you get this much rain, how long does it take to uh, get absorbed into the ground? Uh, well, Lucy, the one thing that amazes me, it, it, it absorbs surprisingly fast. Now, certain areas, of course, will hold water for a long time, 
Uh, but if we get a bit of sunshine tomorrow, uh, a lot of the roads that we haven't been able to drive on today, uh, so for example, where we saw the cheetah this morning, it uh, should be completely passable by tomorrow morning. Now, there will be certain areas that are soggier and wetter than others, uh, but it does dry out quite quickly. But there is a very high water table here in the Mara. So even a little bit of rain and that water table gets a little bit higher, a little bit higher um, till even certain areas that we've been spending a lot of time in now um, where we've driven around no problem whatsoever uh, in a couple of months will actually become an impassable swamp. So the, a lot of the area around hippo pools um, and that is actually during the wet season a swamp. So what I think is happening now is this year that the small rains have started early and after chatting to a lot of people who spent a lot of time in Kenya, they say generally when you have a very dry year um, and the big rains don't deliver what they normally do, um, the small rains come early and, and it has definitely come early this year. The small rains are, are normally in November, December. Um, and so what are we now in September, October? Ooh. So very early. It could just be a little bit of rain but um, it's going to be interesting to see whether this rain continues through uh, into the small rains traditionally one of the driest times of the year uh, when i say dry i'm not talking like sabi sands dry it's just that it doesn't rain nearly every day or every second day is january february um, in between the small rains and the big rains uh, and then when the, the big rains come it's um, march april may uh, and then it lessens off again in June. But unlike the, the dry season of South Africa and, and the Savi Sands, where you've got two very distinct seasons, you've got a wet and a dry season, uh, here you have a less wet season and a very wet season. It's also the altitude we're at. Uh, places in South Africa at a high altitude will also get a lot more rain. Hi, Tannis in Canada. She says, is it steamy in the in the vehicle? Well, Tannis, uh, we've got quite a lot of gaps um, that we've opened up, so not steamy. But yes, it can get very steamy, especially when we there's three of us sitting inside the vehicle for a really long time. Um, I think the other night, Craig and I sat for nearly three and a half hours in the rain. It just didn't stop. Uh, and then it did get quite steamy. We had to sort of occasionally open and to let a bit of air. You couldn't actually see through the windscreen. It missed it up. Okay. <laughs> uh, Kathy would like to know, has the tarp ever caved in from too much water? Uh, no, it hasn't, Kathy. Uh, the only reason it hasn't is because we keep an eye on it. And as soon as we see it starting to sag, we'll push and push it over. Now, um, we are redesigning the roofs and actually pucker has got a redesigned roof and slowly all of our, our vehicles we're gonna uh, we're learning out here so um by by the time big rains come we will be so sorted and waterproof in our in our tent cars uh, that we won't have to worry but it, tristan is on a lion roll this evening and he's now at his third different lion sighting Well, not our third different lion sighting, Brent. We all, it's part of the Inkuma pride. It's just Tinyo slowly striding behind us. So he's just moving and Infumo is just past us as well. So we're going to try and keep up with the boys as they move and follow the Inkuma pride. They've, unfortunately, the Inkuma pride has gone quite a long way from where we are already. So it's going to be interesting to see how quickly the boys catch up but they are seriously moving quite fast now everybody's mobile and everybody's up and going i think the Inkuma pride probably is going to cross into arethusa before our drive finishes but at least the boys are up and i wonder if this is not going to drag them a little bit i'm hoping a little bit more to the east i'm really really hoping that they end up in a situation where they do go towards the east but at this stage it looks like they're heading straight towards Triple M and going to cross over. There's Fumo just using the facilities, as they say. So he's having a little bit of a chance to go to the toilet, as majestic as a male lion can look when going for a squatting toilet break. 
It's, it's nice with the light. You can see the sort of light just shining on him as he's moving along. And Tinio will join him in the next, probably, I would say, two seconds. And Tinio's just behind him. Maybe not two seconds. Uh, let's see. Nope. Fumo is done. And then Tinio coming now. But look how big these boys are looking. They really are filling out quite extensively now. They're getting massive in size. So it's, it's amazing to see just how much bigger they've gotten in the last little bit. I just want to keep my lights off. So look how they've got noses down, they're sniffing, they're scenting, they're trying to work out where are these females, where have they gone, and look at how fast they're walking. It's a much quicker pace than you would generally see. These two don't want to lose this pride. They groomed themselves for too long. The pride ended up getting away from them a little bit, and now they've got to try and keep get back to where they are. And so they're striding out as only male lions can do. They really are kind of moving at a rate of knots at the moment, much faster than you would typically see males. And you can see why the Birmingham's can cover so much ground. If they are walking in this fashion regularly, then you know why they cover the whole of Juma in the space of about two hours sometimes, because these guys are walking seriously fast at the moment. Right. So I'm going to just turn off my lights because I don't want to blind the other vehicles and our lights are very powerful. So I'm just going to turn those off while I'm sort of driving towards other cars. But I believe the Mara unfortunately is about to be driven by another big rainstorm. So I think they're going to be out for the rest of it. So you're with me for the last 20 odd minutes as we follow this pride around and try and see where they're going to go. But we really are very close to Triple M. We're going to cross in the next, I would say, 10 minutes at least is probably, well, at the most, should I say, at the least in the next five minutes. The way these boys are walking, it will be five minutes and we'll be over and across on the other side. I'm just gonna try and quickly get through here and try and keep up with them. So they're just off on my left-hand side. Oof, they are moving very quickly though. So there they go, striding, and you can see why it's being difficult to keep up. Noses down to the ground, trying to sniff for females. It's amazing how these two spend so much time with the Inkuhuma Pride as opposed to Nena and Insuku. They tend to really like the Inkuhuma Pride, so it's been interesting to watch these two in comparison to the others and see how these guys have gone about things. But I think the Inkuhuma Pride has already crossed, judging by the number of lights I see up ahead of me on the road. And that's the road not far from where we are. There's a number of different lights that are here. So I think these guys are about to cross the main road at the moment. So we're just going to have to stand by and watch them go over and into Arathusa in the next, I would say, not even two minutes at this rate. So unfortunately, that's going to be our Lions off. I was hoping we would have them for slightly longer than what we've got now, but it seems as though they are on one mission, and that's to try and get towards Arethusa. Maybe they're heading towards Red Dam, and that's why they're heading in this direction. I'm not quite sure, but you can see here is the main road, and they're about to cross it in the next two seconds. So I'm going to just quickly turn my lights off. Paula, you say male lions always make you think of the movie The Lion, The Witch and The Wardrobe. They do, don't they? They are a bit like Aslan, so they look very similar in that regard. And especially big male lions when they've got these big sort of manes on them. They are beautiful. So you can see Tinio is now leading the charge. He's now gone up front and in full more behind him. But they're going to cross this road in, I would say, like I say, two seconds maybe. They're going to be over and through into... Arethusa and that's going to be the last that we see of them unfortunately for maybe a day or two we know that the Inkuma Pride once they go in here often spend two or three days on this side of the world and it's a pity those buffalo didn't make more noise that brought them along this way so we've got to turn our lights off as they cross over because I don't want to blind the guys in front of me 
I'm just going to pull off to the side so we can still see them as they go over. But there we go. Monique, you say, please roar for us, boys. Unfortunately, they got left behind by the pride, so they're not going to roar now, and they've crossed over. That's the last view we're going to get of them. I've got to put my light down, given that the guys want to come past. And so that's it for us, unfortunately. In Kuma Pride, gone. Birmingham's gone. And, well, it's going to be 20 minutes of trying to find something else. Hopefully, we'll get lucky with another interesting sighting somewhere. I'm sure we'll find some owls or maybe some night jars or genets or something like that but these guys are going to struggle to follow them where they've gone now and it's not a very pleasant place where they've crossed lots of zebra wood in there which is very bad for one's tires so they're going to have a really tough time of it over the next little bit cheers buddy we'll see you later Aiden, who's 14 years old. Aiden, you're asking if I've ever seen a lion kicked out of his pride or moved out of his pride. Yes, I have. I've seen a number of different young males being kicked out. I've seen the Styx young male, the Solala young males, um, Southern Pride males, Hilda's Rock males, Charleston males. So a number of different young individuals that have been kicked out. How are you doing? You well? Very well, thank you. Sorry, sorry. Good. Unfortunately, they've crossed over and they've gone. Yeah, so they've all gone over, unfortunately. Yeah? Yes? Yes? It's just alphas that killed uh, an intruder, basically. Yeah, so it's breeding season now, so they go after the hornbills. That's breeding season, so they go after any intruders that come in. So it dispersed from another flock, and that's why they've killed it. Yeah. It's pecked it to death. Yes, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. Anyway, sorry guys, I am live, so I'll, I'll chat to you soon though. Nice to see you though, and have a good evening and enjoy. So I was just quickly chatting to some of the guys that follow Safari Live, and they were asking me about the crazy hornbill sighting that we had of the hornbills killing them. So there we go, there was a viewer question. Live, but live, live. So there we go. <laughs> kind of just quickly had to satisfy them and sometimes you know when people are out here and they watch the show and things like that it's it's always nice to interact with them and we try and do it off air but since it's just me this evening that's why I had to just quickly answer them quickly about the hornbills and why they were killing each other and as I was explaining and so for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about the ground hornbills that we have on Juma they killed another ground hornbill a few days ago and basically what happens is at this time of the year we have nesting season and breeding season and so the alpha pairs within a ground hornbill flock get very very territorial and they get very kind of nervous of other hornbills being in the area and they get quite angry if other hornbills are around and then you'll get a situation where if any intruder comes anywhere near they're going to try and go after it and try and get it out of there and sometimes though generally they just chase it away they don't really actually get hold of it but for some reason they must have gotten hold of this bird and they just pecked it to death which is not a very pleasant way to go i would imagine it being pecked to death by ground hornbills seems like a very unpleasant way to be handled in life so there's a few impalas up ahead i'm just going to turn off my lights so i don't blind them <laughs> so Lou is uh, saying yes now it's much more pleasant to have it sitting in our freezer at the camp because I've unfortunately I, the researchers wanted it and they haven't been able to come fetch it so it's now a situation where I've told all the staff not to touch the hornbill that is sitting in the freezer and everyone's a bit grossed out by this hornbill it is in plastic bags you can't even see it you can't see anything of it but they wanted to to be able to do a bit of DNA testing to be able to check out what's going on so I do apologize crew that I have shoved a dead hornbill in our freezer I'm very sorry I will it will be removed tomorrow morning I promise they're coming to fetch it tomorrow and everything can be right in the world 
as it goes. So we have to label it so just in case anybody got the wrong idea and thought it was something else. So it's been labeled Hammond Harry, unfortunately. That's what we decided to call that hornbill that died. Is Given the circumstances, I thought Hammond Harry was quite an apt name, which was Lou's name. Lou actually came up with that name, so well done, Lou. Lou's got a very wicked sense of humor sometimes, so... <laughs> so Lou's laughing at me saying, play, saying that I'm naughty for bringing it up. Well, it's true. It's exactly how it is. You can't shy away from your own traits. You have to embrace them and utilize them to the best of your abilities. <laughs> so Lou's saying that's why she's behind the camera, not in front. Well, unlucky Lou, I've just uh, brought you in front of the camera virtually through the digital world. So there is one of your secrets has been aired to the masses. Right. Now, I wonder if there's any bush babies around. Ah, James, you are thinking along the same lines as that I am thinking of at the moment. You saying is it too much to ask for a last minute leopard? James, it's never too much to ask for a last minute leopard. In fact, last minute leopard is always on the cards and always something we're looking out for. And wouldn't it be nice last minute Shongile? That's what I'm going to put out into the air. So out go good juju all over the place. Come last minute Shongile, out you pop. Let's see how you are and hope that she's doing well. That's what I'm going to throw out there. But I would love a last minute leopard. It would certainly end off a rather crazy drive i don't think i've seen two prides of lions and the birmingham boys ever since i've been here in one afternoon so it's really quite nice alexis you've been wondering how shungile is doing i think you and a lot of other people including myself are wondering how shungile is doing we haven't seen her since her altercation with tandy we've seen tracks and the other day we had tracks that came into ingers very small leopard tracks into ingers down philemon's towards treehouse which is typical shungile movement and so i think she's around I just think she's really playing it very safe and very cautious so she's probably flying under the radar you might find she's even shy of the vehicles at the moment um, she's trying to just keep a little attention away from her as possible and so she might just be hearing cars coming and then slinking off into the distance and, and trying to get away from us so she might be around but we're just not seeing her and I'm sure she's just keeping a low profile which is the clever way to do things with so many females being around we know Tandy's been around we've seen Shadow recently we had Kuchava now. She's, the best thing for her is just to be silent. Don't sort of send mark, don't call, don't attract attention to yourself and try and just stay as hidden as possible. Also, a lot of people are saying, you know, a month is a long time since we've seen her. But you must remember that we went, I think it was almost six to, or eight weeks that we went without seeing Shongile the one time. She does kind of move around. I know not, none of the other lodges have seen her, which is strange because generally she used to go into Little Gauri and they used to see her there and we used to get the odd update about her on that side but you never know maybe she's gone up into Biffle's Hook and went that way remember the female tracks that we've been seeing have been around the northern area so maybe she went up into Biffle's Hook and it's just lying low there so I'm not too worried about her I think she's still around I think she's okay I think she's just being very smart about what's going on and trying to stay as hidden as possible over the next little bit which is the way she's going to survive if she's if she is to survive out here and she is to forge a way and to become a territorial individual around Juma she's going to have to be very smart about it and she's going to have to keep a low low profile and try and just stay under the radar until she gets big enough at around sort of two two and a half years to start forging her own way and find a territory I mean, we know that Kuchava gets chased by Tandi as it is, so that's mom chasing daughter. So she's got a tough time of it to try and keep up and try and keep Tandi and Shadow at bay and, and any other young females that come in. We, at the end of the day, we know Nchila has been coming in every now and then. Tiani made a, a run in here once. So there are younger females that are bigger than her that are also around. So it's tough for her. She's going to have a really tough time. We've said that from the beginning that Shongile is going to have to be very clever and very sneaky in order to stay here and to become a part of Juma. So her fight with Tandi was unfortunate and it's not ideal, but she, as far as I know, didn't sustain any real massive injuries when I left her she was still very much fine she was up in the tree she, to climb up a tree would have required some energy and so she's okay I also funny enough met two guides from Londolozi today and I had a chat to them about a female down there and just to put people's minds at ease about how resilient animals are given the current climate with 
you know, the Inkuuma female and Shadow and Tandy and their, their injuries that they're all carrying at the moment. Um, there's a female down in Londolozi at the moment. I think, I can't remember her name, Inkovani or something like that, who's got a very bad limp and is her whole leg is atrophied away. There's no muscle left. She's walking on three legs, so it's a back leg. But the amazing thing about it is they were telling me that in the last three weeks, this this leopard has killed something like six different bushbuck and has hoisted three of them into a tree, even on three legs. So it's amazing how resilient these animals are, how strong they are. And I'm sure Shangila is just fine. I'm sure she's just taking it very easy and being very clever. And that's the way it needs to be. And if we don't see her for a while and we, and we battle to find her and she survives, well, I'm fine by that completely. I don't mind if that's going to be the case obviously I would like to see her and like to know that she's doing okay every now and then but if it means that she's going to survive and become a territorial female here in Juma later on and this is what it takes for her to get there then I'm okay with her being a little bit on the shy side over the next little bit Mrs. Zero, you're saying if I could be an animal for a day, which one would I choose? Hmm, interesting. Because that's a different one to being an animal for life. Oh, there's a little scrub here talking about animals. So while we look at the scrub here, I'll think about this. Because if you were going to be an animal for life, then I think I would be an elephant. Given that they live a nice long life, they roam around, very little to worry about other than people. And it would be, you know, you can go swimming, you can go and break big trees down and you have a really quite an easy life. Look at how slinky this scrub is in this wind. It's trying to keep its ears down. Shame. It must be a little bit nervous in this wind and battling a bit to hear what's going on. Um, so elephant would be if I had to be for life for a day. I think I would be something really random just because I would love to know where they go. So I think I'd be something like an aardvark or a pangolin or a striped polecat or a caracal. Caracal is what I'd be. There we go. I've decided because I have not seen a caracal in Sabi Sands and I want to know where they go and what they get up to and how to find them. So if I could be an animal for a day, I would be a caracal so that I could know where they're hanging out and what they're doing and how it to find one here in the Sabi Sands as our scrub here disappears. So that would be my random animal for a day. Zona, you say, how often do we see caracals on the night drive? Zona, the answer to that is, in my case, never. So I have yet to see a caracal in the Sabi Sands, and it's a sore point. I don't really want to go into it too, too much because everybody I've spoken to has at some point seen a caracal in the Sabi Sands, except for me. I count myself very lucky that I have seen pretty much every other species of land-based mammal because obviously there are bat species that are difficult to ID and I don't think I've seen all of them that occur here but in terms of land-based mammals I have seen everything even a striped polecat at Chitwa so that is something that pretty much 90% of the guides here in the Sabi Sands have not seen um, and so I count myself very lucky to have seen those odd fox pangolins various other animals that are considered rare um, I've even seen a sable in the Sabi Sands so the only thing that I have not seen is a caracal and it drives me crazy because I've tried to look for them everywhere. As far as I know here on Safari Live, we've only ever seen a caracal once and that was by Taylor on Cheetah Plains in March, I think. Maybe March or April, twice. Uh, and there was another sighting in 2008, apparently. Well, there's a nightjar talking about the nocturnals. Hello little nightjar, and look how camouflaged that nightjar is. I'm going to shine my light because otherwise you'd battle to see it. But is it a nightjar? Just go above my light a little bit. It's oh, There it is, there it goes. Yes, it was a nightjar, but it was incredibly well camouflaged. And I was trying to show you the camouflage, but I didn't want to spotlight it too much but it is now flown away and unfortunately we can no longer see it so that's not ideal the problem with this wind as well is I haven't heard any owls tonight I was kind of hoping we would find some owls at some point and be able to see them but it's some reason none to be heard I think the wind is messing with our hearing at this stage Graham 
you're saying have I gotten or gotten into my new book yet uh, for those of you who don't know what Graham is talking about Ali got me a new book and it is basically the tracks of the inter invertebrates of South Africa that has just been released and Graham no I'm waiting for Ali to bring it back from town she's back on Wednesday I think so I'm going to get stuck into that book very quickly and you say it's your new favorite book in, in terms of field guides so I, I, I gather that you've got it and that you've gotten into it and that it is good so I'm super looking forward to it and I can't wait to utilize it and see it out in the field and, and to use it on bushwalks I'll certainly will bring it out and show everybody what we're talking about but it's going to be very cool it basically focuses on tracks of spiders and grasshoppers and scorpions and um, snails and anything like that and signs of them so not just the tracks that they leave behind but also the signs of those animals so the let's say the the cocoons that they spill, spin the nests the any sort of eggs that they lay things like that that we can use to identify them so i'm super looking forward to that book i'm really 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 interested to go through it i know steph is dying to get his hands on one so is taylor i'm sure brent wants to get one and it's only just been released a few days ago it wasn't hasn't been out for long so i'm really looking forward to get into that and then there's another book that i'm trying to get hold of although it is a very costly book and that is the ants of south africa so th thanks to james richard who sent me a link onto the ants of south africa they are unfortunately quite expensive and so i'm just trying to shop around a little bit and see if i can find one but it looks also very very cool well ants of southern africa because i would love to know more about them they're such interesting little creatures they are phenomenally um well organized and i would love to learn more about them so hopefully that book will i'll be able to secure that and then there's a whole host of other books that i want to try and get in fact i actually have an order that i want to place with fagasa which is the field guide association of south africa which is for a whole bunch of books that i'm looking for and hopefully i will get them soon and then i will be able to share all of it with you guys as to what i actually see sorry impalas i'll turn my light off i'm so busy yakking and shining spotlights that i ran out of hands to be able to turn the light off on the impalas oh come on wendy there we go so wendy's led light sometimes decides not to work and if i turn wendy's light on then my monitor over here goes off and then you have to kind of fiddle a little bit and eventually it gets right so i don't know what's going on with the electrics it's something to do with the fuse causes that problem so i have to kind of replace the fuse every now and then which is a bit odd but anyway that's okay um so there's a number of books that are coming my way and i'm going to probably be a bookworm for the next few weeks um i've got to go now on my next leave in october i unfortunately have to go and get a very problematic wisdom tooth taken out so i've got a nasty sort of surgery that i've got to have so i'm going to be bedridden i think or at least immobile and so i think that's when i'm going to be into the books and having a look and checking things out and and studying up for summer bushwalk season and that's going to be a fantastic time i'm really looking forward to it and i'm sure there's going to be lots of interesting things to go through but look at the dust as I'm driving from the wind. If I shine my light, you can actually see the dust clouds following me. You know it's windy when you drive and you're driving in your own dust cloud. It's not ideal for the sinuses, but it's quite amazing how the dust is actually being blown straight in front of me as I'm driving. It's not something that you see every day. It's certainly not something that I was hoping to have. And now I'm going to try and change direction so that the dust blows away from me and not into the car because otherwise everything gets covered in dust. And like I say, up in the sinuses and in the eyes and then you have watering eyes and everyone thinks that I'm crying and when I'm not so it's better to avoid such situations lots of impalas around on quarantine open I wonder if we're gonna get a little white-tailed mongoose somewhere around here there was a white-tailed mongoose that hung around for a few days so I'm hoping that the white-tailed mongoose is around now Lou if you can hear me if you can speak so I can there we go that's better now I can pick you up again <laughs> so Paula your daughter I don't know who what her name is but she wants us to find a snail because she thinks snails are cute well Paula I promise 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 that I will find you a snail but Paula I have to wait for the rains we're gonna have we don't have snails now until the rains come so we won't see the snails at all the big giant African land snails they unfortunately only come in the rainy time so I'm waiting for that to happen and as soon as the rains come I promise Paula that I will show your daughter 
a snail. Just remind me when the rains are around and I will most definitely do it for you. Now, sitting in the darkness over there is one of our stripy friends that I haven't seen for a few days. There's a zebra that is currently just sitting and staring and hoping to stay safe on quarantine. Interesting though, it's all by itself. It's the only zebra that we have on quarantine at the moment that I can see. So it must be a male that's just distributed out. Now I'm trying not to shine too much light on it. And because we were with the lions for a while and we've been live, we haven't been able to put on my infrared light. So I don't want to shine on it for too long, but I thought you would be all interested to see a little zebra. It's always nice to see the zebras of Juma and to see them up on quarantine. James, you say that we should start keeping track of our cat streak on Juma because, well, it's been a while since we've had a day without a cat. We, most certainly, James, we've been really, 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 really fortunate. In the time that I've been back, I've yet to do... I've done one drive without a cat, but I've had cats every single day that I've been back, which has been pretty crazy. So apparently five days solid. That can't be right. It's got to be more than five days solid since I've had cats. It's... We need. I only think we need to recheck that because I'm sure since I've been back it's been more than five days and we've had cats pretty much every single day since I've been back so it's been really great and the nice thing is that we've had a variety so the days when we haven't had leopard we've had lions and the days that we've had the lions you know we haven't had the leopards but it's been okay we've been kind of looking out for all of them we've even had a bit of excitement with cheetah tracks so it's been really good now unfortunately it's that time of the night where we've got to say goodbye so for myself and Senzo and a very wet Brentley Smith and the Mara it's been an absolute Pleasure, and we'll see you all on the Sunrise Safari tomorrow.